Just the two of you and you try to decide. We had to, uh, I mean, there was a little bit, we did a little like UFC thing, put them all in the octagon. for recruiting for something? I'll just put But the kids do it themselves? Yeah. Media department. I don't know. Yeah, um, more so than three, three club. A lot more so more than that. Say, like, <laughs> if you have ladies, I would love a little. Game has changed. <laughs> Okay. Wonderful list of announcements in terms of the activities underway. Uh, week uh, here. I won't go into all those because you. Go into its part. Or, no, actually, no, we're going to do, do. So, A was the reiterating, and please read what's in the public record there because there are about 10 or 11 different activities. When I get to my district, 
number 1C is an appointment of um, the FTE Probationary Assistant Director of Special Education, which the board needs to vote on. Does anybody have anything to say before we vote? Do you want to make any introductory remarks or do you want me to? Or yeah, Unless the board just wants to move to the vote and then after. Yeah, I'll say that the board had, um, uh, you know, Board had a half an hour to meet with our candidate, and uh, we were very excited for uh, where this continued focus on special education and our community's support for those students and families. Uh, adding another administrator in this position seems to be a very positive step that uh, I believe is a shared opinion of many on this board. I want to echo what my colleague said. We we had the opportunity to read about this candidate. We also had the opportunity to um, meet briefly meet her, and um, I think it's a great asset. It's going to be a great asset. Um, we all saw it. We all felt it, and I want the community to know that this is not. A wasted opportunity and and it's it's really going to help our district so I'm hoping that when I mean let me just leave it there <laughs> anyone else no? okay um, do I have a motion to approve the hiring of this is what I say of um, Mary Angela Sanchez to the assistant director of special education so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, uh, oh, um, first of all, congratulations. Yes. Um, Melissa, I just don't think he can vote virtually. Oh. We have to, yeah. So we'll take your vote down, Alex, but it might not count. <laughs> okay. And then, okay. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and then after you, uh, please, because then yeah. I'll, I have a few I, words. Yeah, I just want to be really fast and say thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really excited to bring my special ed knowledge to your district and build capacity and help the teachers and students and families. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, since we're there are not many here, we do know people are watching live stream so and it's recorded so let me just say a few things um, there will be a statement going out very promptly to the special ed staff so they tonight hear about this appointment and then tomorrow probably around by midday a letter will go out to the entire staff and community from me about the appointment um, as is necessary and important this material is kept in executive level private up until the meeting because if this level of appointment is his hand or all over you need to keep that private in respect to the candidate respect to the district where it's been uh, to make sure you actually have the job before it's for the job <laughs> um, that's just standard practice so I just want for anyone <laughs> wondering about the sequencing of what appeared on the agenda that's standard practice and very very important Got it. Uh, we have landed a superb individual in this job uh, she went through a very long process. She hung in with us uh, from the very beginning, uh, knowing this position was back and forth. Is it a, a different debate, discussion as to whether it would exist, and hung in there. Um, and went through then a very thorough process, extra thorough at the end, mm -hmm. with several, I think, three extra interviews at the end, uh, including an hour long with me and, and Melissa Szymanski and Laura Sullivan, really to have a conversation but press on some things and and in the letter that go out tomorrow I'm going to say a few things and, and I'm going to say is we have someone who is a career school psychologist highly trained and proven expertise in that realm coming out of the New York City schools we're currently overseeing some 70 school psychologists in about a hundred different sites um, has, has worked with the full range of New Yorker and it's a magnificent city uh, so the full range demographically SES so uh, socioeconomically, thank you. Uh, get Bill, stop acronyms, speak English. Um, so <laughs> that, that full range. Yeah. Um, and then uh, what's very wonderful about special ed, it's an increasingly challenging area with children of a great range of needs. And our
clear that while expert technical you gave so much was I start with a sensitivity for the child I start with the sensitivity of the family and I ha I'm transparent yep that's what you said I've said to the board hold me accountable that your entry and transition is a good one so for coming into a brand new position uh, in a department uh, with two great leaders now a third uh, and also a department with lots of expertise and a lot of commitment and dedication to the families and students so it's a department with great pride, uh, and that means you relationships and relations will be key. Uh, but I committed to the board, and I'm committing publicly to the community. We're going to do everything we can to help your entry succeed, uh, because this is a critical, critical moment. The children of Hastings, uh, for the staff and and the board. And so I'm so thrilled that you agreed to stay in the race, and that you won the race. So yes. thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And. You guys can stay for the rest of the meeting if you want, but you don't need to. <laughs> Thank you for the <laughs> if you change your mind and want to come back. Right. Okay. Exactly. We'll talk about, okay. Um, moving on to item 2A, we're one week into school, and um, what's the school opening update, Dr. McPherson? Uh, be efficient for you. Um, the as I said in the Friday letter, I've, I've, I'm, I'm not a very much of a superstitious guy, but when it comes to determining, I'm very superstitious. Mm -hmm. And I, when people tell me it's been a good opening, I say, yeah, it's been a good opening. But um, I myself don't rate it, because every time I have, uh, I live to regret it. Um, so it, I've been told it was a very good opening. Um, some things that last year were just real points of pain for us. Thank you, Maureen, for making sure our transportation, yes, there's always going to be some hiccups uh, and some challenges, uh, but we, we work through most of those. Uh, there's a win for uh, Hastings with the redo to Farragut and the additions of bike lanes, uh, but that has meant traffic's a little more dense, if you will, uh, at, at drop-off and pickup time, but we, that's why in Friday's letter I flagged that. Actually, the board leadership asked me to flag they were aware of that. So that was part of maybe an opening challenge. but. The spirit has been strong, the enthusiasm strong, uh, and so it's been, as I've been told, a very good opening. Uh, as part of the opening, um, we will soon be letting the community know about our move on the portrait of a Hastings learner. I think the board may be talking a little bit about that tonight in terms of the board role. Uh, we're working very closely with, with uh, Judith Wilson, external partner for us on that. Um, as I'm proud to say, uh, the superintendent's getting a lot of free coaching from one of the best superintendents here in the Northeast. Uh, she had a 19-year veteran out of New Jersey, running the Princeton schools for nine years. Before that, another very significant, that must be her calling, uh, another you know, 10, 10 years. But clearly, uh, giving us great guidance, giving uh, um, the whole team great guidance. So we'll be talking about the core team. It will be established to work very intensively on that process. It will be very inclusive group. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, and there'll be a set of surveys going out later this month to everybody. Uh, that's uh, part of the information. But the court, but the Portrait of the Hastings Learner is underway. Now for a little fun stuff. Homecoming week is here. Maybe, you know, Gus uh, and all will speak to that in a little bit. Um, but uh, are you going to speak about homecoming? Good. So he's got it. He'll run with it. Um, and you're going to introduce your colleague in a second. Um, this is a very important month. It's uh, the celebration of National Hispanic Latin yes. uh, Heritage Month. Uh, my Friday letter will speak to that a little bit. Uh, far more than the Friday letter will be other information coming out. Some very uh, important and exciting events planned this month. Uh, in particular, Andre Fordio, am I getting his name right, who uh, came to fame through Hamilton as a percussionist. Uh, thanks, to, thanks to the Hastings Education Foundation will be in district later this month, uh, working with students uh, on a range of musical, culturally relevant pieces. Um, also this fall will be on the on October 1, SEPTA's Fall Carnival. I think they're pleased to be back to that. Um, then uh, another thing which matters, if you're up at Hillside and you've seen the, the students in colorful safety vests, that's the safety patrol. Uh, we're back at it. 
graders, uh, and they're very important. I, I'm mourning a week I'm up there, and they keep me in line. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, they're there helping guide students out of cars and out of buses to the right place, and also managing hallways a bit. It's a, it's a peer leadership moment. Most of you know because you've seen it in action, but we're pleased to continue that again. Uh, the Whom Do I Contact, it's a document on the website that uh, we unveiled last year. Uh, we've updated it, freshened it up, and we just encourage everyone to use this. If you got a concern or frustration, start here. Look at to where you go. First, start please as possible. It's laid out here. If you're not getting the answers you need, then you can move up the ladder, if you will, uh, as is explained here. And this has been updated with all the correct phone numbers, contacts, and all the rest. Uh, we unveiled Friday, thanks to Jackie Saviano, something called The Buzz, a, a short video clip. It'll be a series every other week. Uh, it is not about the superintendent. Uh, the superintendent <laughs> simply hosts it. Um, my family does not want it to be about the superintendent. Uh, my daughters did not want it to be But anyway, um, so it's very important that we get ideas for others to feature, be they uh, students, uh, uh, faculty, all the rest, because we think it's a nice way to, to bring to life what's happening here. Lastly, on a very serious note, uh, safety and security is is my top priority. It's the top priority of the district. It has been here for that way for a while. Families can be assured this is their district. We put first priority in that. Thank you for forging a relationship with Alteris. Uh, we'll have a new contact here today we'll introduce her awesome. to the community going forward the board may this fall want to have an executive session on security you're allowed to do that because it's critical and the community needs to know this that there's certain things that we have to keep confidential uh, and the state allows you as a board to go into executive session to remember that those things are paid attention to mm -hmm. um, just so you know uh, out of the blocks one of the major superintendent regional bodies Friday their whole focus was on the issue of security and safety and as educators, we don't want to have to be focused on that, but we, but we, we have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just want to, we can talk more about that with you, the board, on things we're allowed to talk about in public, but I think it would be important at some point this fall to have an executive session so you can get updated on that. Um, we did learn final comment mm -hmm. in the regional superintendent meeting that New York State has on the books laws that make us potentially one of the safest places to be as it relates to guns. Um, and simply not being pro or con on gun, but basically gun safety. And us as educators on the front lines of being able to be sensitive to any person at any risk of not being in a good place. And then New York State has given uh, the authority out to make sure we can intervene just to make sure there's, we, we can be safe. Uh, so this is a place where New York State truly is leading the nation. And that was something that was reiterated to us by the Westchester DA on Friday. Uh, just to say you have the ability I'm not being pro or anti-gun here, uh, but just the ability to keep people safe as it relates to the, these issues. So I have to be somber, I have to be serious on this, and I hope you all understand why. Lastly, I did not want to talk about COVID. Uh, we are very much in a getting to normal state with it. Uh, we will do weekly counts. Uh, that's going to be important, not daily counts anymore, weekly counts. Uh, there is a little confusion right now as to what's required to submit to the county and submit to the state. So don't look for this to be comparative data. Uh, this will be simply, I mean, compared to other districts or locales, but week to week, it'll give us a handle on where we are. Uh, it's pretty basic right now. Um, if you're not feeling well, stay home. And I'm gonna be reiterating that, reiterating that to our staff and everyone else, that if you're not feeling well, stay home. That COVID-19 positive confirmed, you gotta ISO for, uh, for five days. That's just really important until you feel better and, and can come back. And, and masks at that point do matter. But I'll be reiterating that. But in terms of the opening to go full circle, it's felt very, very normal. Very, very much like we're, the COVID is a piece of what we are, but we're able to roll with it and manage it uh, and be very much what I understand Hastings was pre-COVID. So a little longer than you may have wanted, but uh, hopefully helpful. And now, I mean, you'll be back up later, but you have a key introduction, Gus, because I've been not using a certain name, so you can use the name first. <laughs> I do. So I am so lucky to have, drumroll, Eliana Carvalho um, with me as our other student liaison on the Board of Education this year. Um, she was a clear choice among a really, really wide range of very qualified candidates. 
Um, her resume is really, really long and really, really impressive. <laughs> um, to just name a few items, um, she's the director of Hastings Kids, which is a uh, sort of volunteer organization that runs uh, right at the high school. Um, she's co-president of the SAD, or Students Against Attractive Decisions Club, um, which is doing some awesome work. She's very involved in uh, Hastings Theater and is very often the lead in our place. Um, uh, she's in the course and the madrigals um, and is a star student. Um, she's also a producer on The Lab, uh, which is an organization that uh, puts together open mic nights. Um, and she's on a couple leadership task forces, which she could tell you more about. I didn't even know there were leadership task forces, so I was way <laughs> ahead of the game. Um, uh, in summary, we're incredibly lucky to have her, and she's going to be consistently making me sound stupid when I talk. <laughs> um, but, uh, Thank you, Gus. I'm very excited to be part of this, and I look forward to the years ahead. Congratulations. Thank you. Eliana was the student representative um, on our reopening committee to make sure that students in Hastings could be educated during the pandemic. So she had a very important voice in the process. I did want to acknowledge that. My daughter's name is Eliana, so I'll never forget. <laughs> it's the name. best name. So, yeah, totally. <laughs> Eliana, I think that with the labs, you are one of the cool owners, right? Because Mary Lewis told me about, about it. Yeah, um, basically my job is to spread the word about the open mic nights and then add a collaborative <coughs> sort of aspect to it. Um, I'm able to share my ideas, my opinions, if we want to <coughs> somehow introduce different creative aspects to the open mics, like poetry slams or just doing performances of anyone's creative work, then we're able to do that. It's great. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much. You're very lucky you have Gus to. Yeah, I know. should say that. Totally. We're thrilled to have two students obviously presenting opinions and uh, comments to the board and to our administrators. So we do appreciate the time you guys take. We call on you often. Because our meetings so. are not <laughs> always entertaining. Right. But thank you <laughs> for joining us. Guys, Wherever. It's always fun. Yikes. Not always implies. <laughs> wow. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Bill, do you have anything else for the highlights? <laughs> I, I, or that I, was all rolled up? I, so I, I, Perfect. The best highlight was we just heard. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Maureen okay. Smackdown. <laughs> okay. Moving on to um, administrative reports, 3A. This is the report from Assistant Superintendent. Sure. So a couple of updates. The first is around APPR, which is our annual professional performance review process that's required by the state. And every year, in accordance with the state APPR requirements, teachers need to be observed by a lead evaluator and also an independent evaluator. Most districts, and we are one of them, have both of those people as administrators on faculty. But one is in your building, and basically one isn't your key person, so to speak. So the administrative team and I met to determine who would be observing whom and which capacity, and that's a very big task to be able to sort out how the observation process will work and why. So we did that early this year. Theater planning, uh, Phyllis Udis at Hillside uh, has assumed the theater production oh, coordinator wow. role following Gerard Marciano's retirement from the district. And Phyllis and I met to discuss expectations for budgeting, purchasing procedures, staffing for directors, musical directors, stage managers, choreographers, casting, space usage, communication. Uh, today there was some information about sets and figuring that out. So she has jumped right in full speed and she's doing a phenomenal job. So I did want to announce that she's filled some very large shoes and she's doing just great. So we're thrilled to have her in that role. Now, the New York State Education Department every year has us complete within the business portal something called the Consolidated Application. And that enables the release of Title IA and Title IIA funding for the district. While we don't receive a huge amount of funding through the title grants, we are eligible for some, so we, we take advantage of whatever we can in terms of applying for that on behalf of the district. So as part of that process, there needs to be 
consultation with private schools, both within our catchment area and also private schools that any of our students attend. So that process has to happen every year. Um, and there's also a consultation and collaboration process where the state identifies key stakeholder people that you need to consult with. So we did have that consultation and collaboration that says required. And then all of the necessary, all of the necessary budget narratives, um, relevant required forms, everything is now with the state. So it goes into the portal, also get mailed, gets mailed, and hopefully we'll hear back soon about whether or not we'll be approved for some grant monies. And um, English language learners have been a very huge priority as we transition into the school year. And Adriana Boudreau, who's our data coordinator, Michelle Porter, who's our registrar, Janice Mateo Toledo, who has the role of ENL coordinator, and I have been working very closely together to ensure proper identification of our English language learners. There's a process for that, um, and our teachers are involved in that. Parent access to translated documents, making sure interpreter services for school events are queued up so that our families um, can all have access. And then finally, digital learning and technology. We'll be setting a date for a presentation to and discussion with the board uh, around technology in Hastings, and we understand there's been interest by members of the board to learn more about that, digital learning and technology specifically. So I'd be interested to learn more about what the board's looking for in this area so that we can plan for that. And, um, I know that there's some questions about device use in the classroom, and then if there's anything else, just please let us know. Is that something we want to talk about now or no? Well, I think what, I mean, Melissa and I talked a lot about a number of things, um, but I, I mean, she's exceptional at work, so I'm trying to, try and give her a lot of room to run. This one to talk about, um, and I know there are questions all over, not just in Haiti. We wouldn't have made it through COVID right. with any sort of educational ability. And we know nationwide has been a major issue. We're actually in a pretty good place. We have to, but this is a good time to reflect on what is our use of technology. We have a technology plan. It's required by the state. Actually, it's required that you as a update on that. I think at the we built into the plan. So. Built into the plan. Yeah. So that's late September. But very simply, now we'd be looking either in this meeting or really the next several days. Uh, an email into me about what, what are the questions you have regarding digital learning and technology. We know for sure screen use is one. Uh, let's say we cannot control screen use out of the district, out of here, <laughs> right? Uh, but it then is given how prevalent it is in all of our children's lives, uh, remember the parent, that it's then saying within school, how do you optimize it? Um, I've been lucky to have been around this pre-COVID in Greenwich and all, I was lucky to be superintendent there when we got way out on front on digital learning technology. So I, I have a bias that you need it. It's got to get done right. You don't get anywhere with that good digital learning and technology. Um, uh, but it's got to be blended in, a piece of it, and we need to be thoughtful about it. So we're looking for questions that you want answered so we just don't talk at you, mm -hmm. just to put it very simply. I could just throw out maybe a couple right now. You know, one is from an investment perspective. You know, how do we think about investing in technology that can become, uh, you can lose the investment very quickly. I mean, how do we, how do we approach, you know, how do we approach that? Uh, you know, there's some best practices. I, you know, is, is, is everything a software as a service now? Are there, are there apps? that you actually have to purchase, that you have to update, you know, they just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm just throwing out, I don't have answers and thought, thoughts about this, but it's just the whole investment framework that we think about for technology. Mm -hmm. We'll include that. Uh, and, and then, you know, obviously there's the actual integrated learning stuff, mm -hmm. which I think you're obviously on top of it. We have to integrate it smartly, use it to leverage and support necessarily to um, take over learning, but I think you're So that, that's the biggest what one for me i think you know when we start seeing big line items and then people start wondering how long does that line item actually last mm -hmm. you know forever. Yeah. well forever well pay, it pay for it for yeah. a while but is it useful for how long right so but that's a big one for me yeah thank you 
I want to say that when it comes to technology, we all know there's a IT based technology and then there's educational technology, edtech. Mm -hmm. So, and edtech has been there before um, COVID. It predates COVID. So, educational technology is something that is encouraged across schools and, and especially in the universities. That's what I know. So, um, and and educational technology works alongside curriculum in terms of supporting, like um, it, it's there to support, not to take over instruction. So I think that, I know that that's what you're doing, but I think that if the community is able to clearly see that well delineated, that way it's, it's able to show that educational technology piece in supporting instruction um, and now I want to move tech technical to Maureen <laughs> is um, the screens are bad that's why I went and I promise you it saves the eye I, I'm, I'm saying it practically like I, I don't need to wear glasses anymore to look at this because I'm using the blue light which is a health like literally I'm I mean it's not so I'm wondering um, with the fact that we can not necessarily run away from these gadgets. Is there, like, are, are these things being considered? Because our kids, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. So that's that's my number two. So that's about it for me. I'd like to jump in then. Uh, you know, I, I ran for the board to make sure our board was, you know, given a lot of hands hands-off room to administrators and principals because I trust your judgment. But I would share my opinion with you guys. I have a lot of negative opinions about technology in the classrooms. And I think uh, a challenge that I'm sure you guys are more aware of than me, all school districts had a huge ramping up of utilizing technology. And I think one of the tough things for human nature is realizing when to cut the rope and let something valuable and investment go. So whether it's line items, you know, like we maybe got the computers under grants, but now we have to maintain maybe 50 new computers every year. And it's a question, you know, uh, should we continue this asset or do we cut rope and let it just slowly die out? And I think that's a tough line item that uh, we see in the budgets. And as we all know, there's some negative, negative impressions of technology and screens. Uh, one of them that I, you know, hear about are how easy it is for students to continually be off task. You know, when we when we open up screens in the classrooms, it's easy to be in the other window, and uh, you know, these these companies are out there constantly making new links to get around the firewall. And the other one is that students don't seem to corroborate as much, collaborate as much when there's screens in it. So my impression, and it's not backed on uh, as administrator, but it's backed as a teacher and a parent and uh, someone who listens to my neighbors, is that we should be uh, pulling away because we probably had a huge bump up of usage. And while we'd like to see technology incorporated into our teachers PD and our, our students curriculum and instruction, my impression would be that we've probably uh, flooded it for good use. Even last year was a questionable hybrid year. We weren't sure and not all of our students were vaccinated until uh, very, very late in the school year. So if that matches any of your instincts, uh, that would be where I would be uh, concerned about the financial lingering aspect of trying to support technology and concerned about the way it doesn't engage our students in ways that uh, I think we're coming into the class and it's log in and uh, go here and that's not always the most uh, auditory type uh, collaborative learning that I think might have more benefits than uh, another hour on this screens because as parents we're all failing at uh, <laughs> limiting it so we ask you guys to do it instead make the uh, make the eight through two o'clock hour better than what we can do at home That's true. 
And by there, the we I mean is just me. <laughs> Not just but you. Thank you, Not guys. Not just you, actually. Um, I, I just want to tie into what Jeremy's saying. I agree with him. I mean, I am a little bit of a Luddite. People who know me know that. So, um, But I do believe in notebooks and pens and pencils and writing things down. I think that you know studies show that how you, how you remember things is like you have to hear it, see it, and write it down. I don't think typing it is the same as writing it down. Um, I think reading a book, an actual physical book, studies would probably show is better than reading things on screens. I can't, you know, uh, your eyes are crazy. And so my fear, I understand that when we look at probably, you know, you look at big ideas math or some of the social studies or whatever the programs are, they probably have their, sorry, I believe they're probably slightly biased studies that show why that, that learning is best. My fear is mostly the cumulative effect. So that one is good, and that one is good, and that one is good isolated, but the cumulative effect of their on digital and on, on screens all day long, I think that, you know, it's, it, Jeremy's right, it, it probably does not foster collaboration. So there's that aspect of it for our child's brains and how they develop, and it's, it's really hard, you know, I mean, I, I know it's hard for, for you guys, and it's hard for the kids, and, you know, we're all addicted to our screens, I mean, I'm addicted to my I mean, I can't even like open some things. Otherwise, you know, a half hour goes away. So um, my, my other part of that is that I'm finding, you know, from other parents reports from them that it's also difficult for teachers to manage the use of the devices in the classroom because you know, it can be complicated when your device for work is your device for entertainment and, um, you know, there's YouTube on there, and it's hard to monitor what they're doing in the classroom. And so that really, you know, I don't know what kind of break we can put in place. I mean, I, I try at home with the things that we've, I think it's like Go Guardian and stuff. It's not foolproof, though. It really isn't. You know, my kids find ways around it. And I think especially with special um, ed kids, um, it's really difficult for them to remain focused, you know, I've seen this in my own life and I've seen this with my friends and it's very easy to get distracted. So I think for other reasons, just doing their homework at home. So I guess my, my point is a couple of things, you know, I'm concerned about the use in the classroom and how we can monitor the use. We all know that they're messaging each other, that they're watching YouTube and that they're gaming when they're supposed to be in classrooms. Um, and uh, also the cumulative effect of seeing a screen and, and that actual learning um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I mean, this is very Does helpful. Alex, so, have anything to I don't know, Alex, add, if sorry. you want to, and this might be one, if not tonight, <laughs> Gus and Ellen, if you had things you wanted to add, kind of questions that you hope we could come back with some discussion on as it relates to digital learning and technology. For me, I think I was looking at me. I feel like we're talking about you and I'm on the wall. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Topic, you know, uh, you know, I will take up some questions from Melissa, but for me, it's a real open question about buying into, you know, sometimes I describe it to my son, who obviously likes to watch TV. I'm like, imagine if the program wasn't on and what you were doing was sitting on a sofa, staring at a dot on the wall for, let's be kind, two hours. You know, you know what's, what does that do to you? When you're experiencing things, is it's like just that. Session. How much are you doing? You know, and that's a concern I have. It just goes back to sort of our understanding of where students are at on their interpersonal skills, um, to their sort of experiential skills. My dad, I think I may have told this story before, my dad, you know, he's from the Alps, and he wanted to learn to swim. This is before computers, obviously, 1930s, late 30s. He bought a book on how to swim, and literally it had little, it had like you know, those flip things where you flip the pages, it would make the strokes. And then he went, he went to the river. And it was, <laughs> so, you know, he had to be pulled out of the river and just you know, like experience is really the best teacher for everything, even if it's failure is mixed in with that. And I think maybe Jeremy raised it, maybe Doreen did, but in all programs. Um, structure built in. Uh, bias is too strong a word, but a certain structure of presentation, a certain process that's built in to programs. And that skill 
of placing a process on a chaotic situation is sort of a core educational value, I think most people would agree. There's lots of different ways to put a name on it. But I have a concern, very particularly, that that skill of organizing a situation where you can then get into it or solve it or move forward with it is sort of lost in the process. And you know, it's not really a question, but that's a topic I would, if I was thinking about what are the parameters that would be at the forefront of my mind. So. Thanks, Alex. Can I just bring up one more thing, too? Is that, you know, when I was in seventh grade, and probably all you guys, I had to take typing, which seems so useless at the time. I was like, when am I going to type? You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, now it's handy. So, um, but I find that my kids and their friends are like, I, I want to watch you guys type. They're like this. When they type, that's how they do it, which they're not like, you know, what's it, a QWERTY board, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, like, if we're gonna bring something back, I'd like to bring back <laughs> just, like, helping them to be better than, like, this, I don't even know what they call that when they do it, but that's the, not efficient and it's not good for their hands. The Z-type the Z website. The elementary. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Here, so. yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> take right. Bill's idea and maybe try to throw something towards uh, students. I was wondering, are you guys old enough that middle school was there there's something, I mean, I think Google Classroom's been such a help, you know, organizationally. Were you in sixth grade before we really started bringing those programs back? Any other programs that you really feel have been exceptional and maybe not the public place to trash any, uh, you know, specific subject areas, but more on the positive side, because I was speaking negatively in general towards technology, but... Gus, you're the oldest here. Were you in, uh, were you pre-Google Classroom for all your assignments? You know what's funny? I, I can't remember. Um, I feel like I never, ever remember a technology program as well as a good teacher. Um, I think that, I, I think in sixth or seventh grade we started have, having Google Classrooms and it was kind of weird and I was like, why are we doing this? And now I, I rely on it um, to see my assignments. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a you know, helpful program, Google, like the Google Suite is awesome. Um, but I feel like in all my classes in Eliana, I don't know if you agree with this or not, I feel like real lessons nine times out of ten are always better than whatever we're doing on the computer. I think when it's, when the teacher is teaching a lesson and we're using this as a resource, that's awesome. When the computer's the teacher, it's, you know, it's, it's like playing a boring video game. It's like, who cares? Um, um, I don't really remember Google Classroom before COVID, but I we did have it, <laughs> um, but I am grateful that we started, like Gus said, because Google Classroom now is, is school. It is everything. Everything is on Google Classroom. Um, I do think that technology sometimes allows students together because students from a distance can still work together at any hour of the day on the computers. And even in classroom settings, we collaborate through shared Google Docs. So we're still talking, we're still near each other, but we're the same document. And I don't know about Gus, but personally for my classes, I've seen my teachers stepping away from using the computers during the day, relying a lot more on notebooks and actual papers that we hand in, which kind of seems a little crazy because everything we wrote was online, handed for in. two years. <laughs> clicking a submit button. But now, especially I believe in the English classes, I've, I've never read a book um, or really articles on the computer. They're usually nine times out of 10 printed out or handed a copy to you. That's great. Good to know. Ellie, and I think your voice was also, correct me if I'm wrong, when we had created the technology plan and that committee came together, we had, um, we had the student session. I believe you were present at that. I might be wrong, but I, I remember students talking about leveraging, like as an opportunity for us even. Um, and I don't, if you were part of that conversation, I'm remembering you in that, that space. But the opportunity for a lot of student leadership there, because a lot of our students have taken what they have learned, and even like self-taught pieces that they've taken and run with to be able to support each other, um, came up as a recommendation from students, which was really neat. So that came up in our technology planning as well. Like we actually 
leverage the expertise and input of the students to do just that because we're the value around collaborative work. So um, if there was anything you remember or want to add, it was a while ago. It so. was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> it stood out for me, so thank you. So I, I think this, there's a little intentional design move here on our part as administration is when we've got the whole year planned out, big <laughs> topics, right? And, and then to say, let's get a little introduction going on what you want to hear later so we just don't come back and dab at you. Um, and later you can test this, but I think there's a very important middle ground we've got to land here. And, and it's, I acted out, so this has got to support and be blended in the use of digital learning technology. And I think what our <laughs> experts right now have begun to say is there's an emerging balance in the best classrooms in Hastings. There's an emerging balance between the digital and the paper. Uh, because I've watched some of the best collaboration happen with great teachers through digital. Mm -hmm. Because Google Docs done right is some of the best collaboration you can, bad English, get at in a room if it's guided correctly. So I think understanding really where we are in Hastings, I think pulling back where it's not getting used right and get to the right balance. Um, so I think the, the challenge is upon us, Melissa, to kind of come back with, you know, it'll be, it'll be a longer discussion. And I think, but part of it is, what's the, what's the really strong middle on this? Mm -hmm. Because the last comment, you just watch education swing from here, now let's swing all the way over here. Mm -hmm. You know, and we can't, we have to get to the middle here, Ron, what's the best use of this? As we do though, I'd like to jump back in. Uh, you know, we have this portrait of a Hastings learner that we're bringing together. Say. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm gonna rip Gus on his first day, no. But you know, <laughs> the voices we're hearing are our high schoolers mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I think some of the voices we're hearing from the parents are more directed towards our, how much screen time we were putting on our middle schoolers. And I think we're thrilled to hear, you know, high schoolers are moving to colleges and the colleges have that whole, you know, remote collaboration. And it's very appropriate that our young adults or our old teenagers, you know, are making that transition to utilizing technology. It's tough to know exactly how it's, you know, if the same uh, effective pullback has been happening in the middle with our teachers who are just as, you know, aware of the needs. I would just share, a, I wanted to build on what Maureen was talking about, about the cumulative reason why it, there's a negative aspect to it. You know, as I taught, you know, the 1.30 class and the 2 p.m. class, my middle school students were in their seventh adult-led lecture or their adult-led Zoom meeting. And I think uh, for most of us who had Zoom, you know, we, you weren't trying to schedule that many meetings in a day on Zoom. You were trying to get away from the screen and do some work. And I, I like the way you, you know, brought that idea up, you know. If hypothetically it's, you know, there's a program that looks great for math and there's another program that looks great for history and then there's another program that looks great for our EOA, EOL students, you know, it, it, there is a, a cumulative aspect. Okay, well, one of these programs is going to be the third time that day or the third time that week. You know, I did during COVID sort of wish that uh, schools just said, you know, you got to read a book every week. And you got to write, you know, we're going to do half day online and half day we're going to pretend like it's Abe Lincoln time. <laughs> you know, gym class, go split wood and go read a book and come back, of course, for your math class online is what I wanted so uh, the balance uh, we leave it up to you guys uh, yeah, but uh, I, I thank like you it. for bringing it yeah I think one thing we should do is as much and if the time's tight but how we come back with what really is truly going on in the classroom right. per right. school right. to, I mean, to Jeremy's to, point we have I think to truly because I'm in and out of classrooms a lot and and I'm I'm not seeing it solely like this much um, I'm not seeing classrooms where I'm not seeing it in Hastings. So I think we need to come back and help you as a board understand what really is going on and then build from that so it's better. So, but I, I'd suggest we move to the next item, which would be, this has been very, very helpful. I took three Great. handwritten notes and then to remember them, I put them in digitally. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard them, now you see them, write them down, they're in there, it's perfect. So it's gonna be See um, here, right tight. Thank you. I just want to thank you so much for <laughs> listening to our requests and, and acting on it. It really means a lot to all of us. Thank you.
Um, okay, next we have a report from um, the business official, Maureen, Ms. Caraballo. So I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, so first, uh, just on the heels of technology, I just did want to thank our technology team, um, which have been just swamped the whole week. I mean, it, it was something I just happened to have before knowing <laughs> we were going to talk about it. Actually, Joe just walked out, but I was going to thank them. They are busy from the time they walk in. There's four people on the team, and, and all day long they're busy. I mean, that, that comes to devices, but th that's going to be, at the, be another discussion because no matter – how much of the day you use them, we are at a point where everyone has a device given to them at the school level. And many people, about 80 to 90 people a day, forget those devices. So it's a constant, including staff. So I just really want to shout out to them. I talked to Joe today. They um, have been working tirelessly. They, they collected all the Chromebooks that we had purchased throughout the pandemic, and we um, repurposed some and, and even re-inventoried because we were really had been giving them out at such a rate that we needed to do that and, and um, they they have been doing a fantastic job and um, I haven't heard many complaints so that's how I know it's going really well because <laughs> if it was we would hear about it um, just also wanted to thank um, for our transportation has absolutely gotten off to a much better start overall although there are you know it's sensitive to the people who may not have had as great of an experience um, we're still kind of tweaking some of our out of district routes. Um, that's always part of any normal beginning of a school year. But I will say that it has been um, a very smooth start and we really do wanna thank all of the people internally also at the buildings that really helped to resolve a lot of our in-district issues prior to the start of school. So there were some, but they were resolved um, for the most part, I'm hoping. And you know, we have not heard anything um, you know, any, anything much about uh, any issues that we have um, had this year. But one of the things I do need to, at one point, discuss with the board is the idea of uh, a long time we flip-flopped early morning and late morning routes year over year. And that is not something we've done the last four years. I've had many, many parents contacted me and um, would like us to consider doing that. And I think it's one of those things that was something that was occurring, but it wasn't anything official documented that we would do it and a few years back the recommendation of the transportation department was that we wouldn't do that it is um, not typical of other districts but historically there has been that um, for parents who remember that there, there have been if one year you're early the next year late and and that actually has been quite a, a hot topic but it's not something I just want to arbitrarily like sure we'll do it you know because I think as many people are asking for it, there's probably people who would not want that to occur, you know? So um, I had actually told people that that would be something that we would either con consider sending out a survey. I just don't want to do it arbitrarily because, you know, I, I, I get it, but it, it also is disruptive to others. So um, that that's one of the things that has come up in transportation that I had promised the families will discuss and consider changing that um, in the upcoming years. Um, I do want to say that although the traffic around the school has been slower or a little bit tighter, actually I think the reduction of the lanes on, on Farragut have made it safer. Um, I may personally see that. Our crossing guards have reported that, although there's um, maybe a, with the, the reduction of which there really was not two lanes in front of the building, that actually has reduced the speed around it. So the good the good news of that, and I you know appreciate, like, I'm not talking it really has made our students, um, in terms of crossing, it, it has created a, a safer um, situation for, for crossing guards and for our students. And, um, you know, so I just wanna, although it's trafficy, it's the positive oh, it's on that. It's a lot better. It's yeah, a lot better. and then also with the switching of hillside schedule, that also is an impact of what we're experiencing here because we have more buses around this area at that same time. So, you know, in fairness to the village, it is, it is actually not a bad thing that we have lost you know a little bit slower traffic around the building and and some of that is caused by our uh, switching of our bus schedule um, what else um, I also I don't know if all of you I'm sure have noticed that all of our facilities have been reopened that was last week but I just wanted to highlight we took advantage of the um, the uh, the insurance that they were redoing our courts and we had pickleball lines uh, put on our tennis courts because we had been requesting that, but it was like a $2,500 fee. And actually, I'll put them on there. We're like, all right, you know, so for the for those in the, the village that have been requesting it for the past three years, we do have now pickle 
Is that what is it? It's pickleball, mm -hmm. pickleball, right? Okay, I'm saying it right, okay. Um, we also did receive our first um, different FEMA funds for, um, nice. although the majority of our damage was um, from Ida was, was covered by insurance, anything that wasn't covered, we actually got the money back. So we're happy that process worked and, and um, we're optimistic that they'll also help pay for our drainage upgrade and there is a, um, proposal on the agenda tonight that um, outlines the work that our architects and engineers need to perform to do that upgrade for us. And um, and once we have that design, then we can submit that to FEMA in the hopes that they will give money toward that upgrade. Because as many of you know, or I believe you would know, living in the village, the village is updating their drainage system throughout the village. And um, we also need to do ours. So that will be, hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be um, talking about that. I just want to mention it because it may require a vote because if we do need to come out of pocket with funds, it's a capital project and we will have to um, release money from the capital reserve to do the work. And then probably have to do that and then see what monies we'll get back from FEMA just in terms of the financing of it. But I wanted to put on your radar because that's kind of where we're heading. Um, it has to be done. It's not an optional project. It's, it's a requirement based upon the upgrades that are um, needed throughout the town. So I just um, wanted you to be thinking about that. And um, I think that is it well for this evening. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments? How long does it usually take for FEMA to get back to us on whether or not they're gonna cover an expense like that? For well, the I mean, this is a, we've worked with FEMA before, but we don't work with them that often. And I think each project's a bit different. I have to say that, um, I was at, at pretty happily happy about the way this process worked in terms of the first payment. Um, I think they were very helpful in, in that. Um, but that was different because we had already expended the funds and then we were looking for a reimbursement. I think this one, which is a different type of FEMA project, which is preventative mm -hmm. uh, maintenance, and there are laws and regulations around what they can fund and can't fund. And, and although, and they have all the players. Also. I mean, there's literally like 20 people. Like when you meet, with, it's, it's actually pretty interesting. But um, but I think they do not commit to the exact dollar amount. But what they do need is they need to understand what you're doing, why they would, I, I believe they, well, they're working also with the village. Um, so they would need to kind of see what they're doing and why you would be, you know, why this would work would be necessary. And then based upon that, um, the, the design, they may have some questions about it to make, you know, ensure that they believe that, um, they're not gonna fund something, I guess, right. that they don't that believe is effective. correct. And then um, you have to document that. And then in terms of the cost, I mean, I think then you, it's, it's gonna require submitted, it, you know, we're gonna need a contractor, uh, construction, you know, likely some, some level of construction management um, oversight. I'm not um, clear, I you know, had asked them about, do they pay for you know, some of the, just the professional services that are required to get, the, to get this work done? And you know, a lot of it is we, you know, we'll pay, as, you know, we'll, once we kind of see what the finalized project is, we'll give you a sense. So that being said, I'm not sure, because everything I've ever received from FEMA has been post After the, the fact, disaster. Yeah, right. um, we actually currently still have an open project for COVID that we also anticipate to get some money back from them on to. So, I mean, th those have been more clear cut to me. So, um, but, but without putting, they, they did suggest that there would be funding for it. I just don't know at what level. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Maureen, I just have a quick question sure. slash comment. I was surprised to see that we, that the families all got a re, um, an option request for to pay for insurance for the Chromebooks at thirty dollars. Yep. Um, it seemed like a lot of money in these times to ask families to do for a, a something that's not optional that they have to get from the school. Is there any way to get it so that the school could get like one big insurance policy that covers all of our Chromebooks, so we're not asking our families to cover that? Yeah. So. So I guess I, you know that can be looked into. I mean that that was kind of put in place when we first went to the one to one um, Chromebook initiative at the high school many moons ago. That was something that districts were already been doing that ahead of us seemed to be the way you know people were handling it because although um, I mean it's different. I guess similar to a textbook when children lose textbooks or things they do have to pay us. And I think what people were suggesting it's you know with with a device that you would 
kind of allow, I mean, no one is required to do it, quite frankly. You're not required to insure it. It is right. an option, but if your child, just like if you lost a textbook, you have to pay us. It, if you lose the Chromebook, it's $270. Now, if it's year one, if it's a brand new Chromebook, and then of course, depending on the age of it, we would only have you reimburse us for the um, depreciated value of it. But it is optional. Uh, we can definitely discuss, I think it's more a board discussion. I think it was just something we put in place at that time um, to kind of, actually self-insured an insurance company but we rather we keep use that money to um believe it or not what kids mostly do their chargers which are still like thirty dollars so we do we do spend quite a bit of money each year just replacing them and we allow the insurance to you know not that we would make them reinsurance as well and there are if children oh, there's not a And it mm -hmm. goes back to the tech. I mean, yes, but there. I mean, it's elite. You're allowed to do that. That's sort of. Yeah, and I think we're not going to have just one discussion on technology. But I think that's something nine, ten years. Ago. It's deeper than that. Maybe fifteen years ago, we're on the leading edge of this. Yeah. Ten years. If you will, mm -hmm. dollar wise. And most districts have gone this way to deal with it and leave it optional. But yeah, I, think I mean, it's a lot of people don't back. pay it. I mean, yeah. so it's not yeah. everyone. Yeah. But, but you do are faced with the outlet, and this gets into the larger. You know, are the devices worth it at certain age levels? Mm -hmm. um, but could I just I, also mention that when we gave out used Chromebooks a few years ago, we only made people pay us ten dollars. It was only when they're getting a brand new device yeah, I, with the cover, which the cover alone is like twenty dollars. So. It, again, that's a board decision. We don't need it. It has helped us um, when children do lose devices. We haven't had to like go back to our budget. We use that fund to do it, and it's um, it actually could maybe be dropped because, quite frankly, we've actually the kids have been really great with them. I mean, I you know historically, except for a charger here and there, may accidentally get left. I we really haven't had the damage I would have initially thought. A couple and, of and that's. I'm coming from a district where the middle school at a 20% rate was breaking their one-to-ones. So if Hastings isn't at a 20% oh, rate, no, no, mm -mm. then right. So I think it's part of the larger discussion. Okay. Can I throw one out to the larger one? Uh, two dates, if you can pull it out, Maureen. Uh, when do you think the high school went to one-to-one, -to -one, and is the middle school at a one-to-one -one Chromebook as well? I know exactly well? when we went to a one-to-one -one at the high school. It was when we got the, well, when I say I know exactly now, I don't I don't mean did. exact, yeah. No, we, it, it did, the, the the first thing we did is when we got the smart school money, which was a federal grant that, um, I want to say it was like 2009 or something like 2009, that. 2009, yeah, we nine. got some nice grants. And we went to, we, we had, uh, we used some of the money for infrastructure, like upgrades to our wireless, and then... Uh, the decision was made at that point to issue um, at each, you know, at the high school we bought each um, high school student a one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative. And then after that, we kind of said, well, once the grant runs out, you know, kind of like back to the funding, then it, yeah. it just, you just pick it up on your books. Um, but quite frankly, during COVID, we also then received another huge amount of money toward technology. That was, there was a lot of money for device acquisition um, and making sure that everyone had had a standard so then again we made another large investment plus there was a need and quite frankly when we sent it out like you know you're not required to take it most people do take them i mean joe's here to speak to it but well, i took them the i took them out of the hill yeah. ones yeah hillside and the middle school so then we ended up purchasing probably another thousand or more so chromebooks and and they really only have three years of a life yep. so to doug's point we do not finance chromebooks we typically have gone to straight purchasing because you're not going to lease a car that's going to break, right? So we don't lease Chrome, but we purchase them directly. We only lease um, yep. technology that has a, a lifespan of over five and years. And then the other part I didn't know about, Maureen, are we uh, one to one for any oh, of the grades every in grade. Far No, in Farragut. Yes, every grade. Every grade. Mm -hmm. And it's actually more than one to one. This is this is well. Our hillsiders are bringing the. Chromebook home and back again. No, not anymore. They get to leave them in the classroom. They're in the classroom, but they also have um, iPads in the K1 and okay. Chromebook carts and, that they share. And then the, uh, second through fourth have a Chromebook cart in each classroom. Thank you. And, and also we have a lot of staff that we provided to them during oh, the pandemic. Sure. They requested it that they needed to teach. 
And then in addition, we have, um, I mean, not, not Chromebooks, well, that's. Then we've also, with the elimination of a lot of our computer labs, we've had to buy some expensive type laptops because some of the, some of the courses like the coding and those type of courses, if you want to run them and those devices and the art and the music have very expensive Better than Chromebook, yeah. And there's not a, like a lot So, I mean, we do spend a lot on technology, but I know that wasn't your question, but just. No, thank you. Yeah. There's, uh, as you said, just something out there yeah. for our next discussions, mm -hmm. Bill. Thank you. Great. Okay, then if we're done, thank you so much, Maureen. We'll move on to our students' report. All right. Well, we are back. Um, the couple <laughs> weeks of school have been off to a pretty awesome start, I think. Um, even before the academic year was kicking off, we had preseason starting. Um, sports teams have had awesome turnouts um, and worked you know, really, really hard for the two weeks leading up uh, to the beginning of the fall season. Um, you know, thanks to all that hard work, you've seen some really successful results. Uh, with our teams already. Uh, we opened up with a lot of wins. Field hockey, I think, is undefeated right now. Uh, football won their game on Saturday, 21-6. Mm -hmm. um, soccer's been racking up wins, both boys and girls. And our 40-person uh, cross-country team did well at our first meet uh, up at Somers last Saturday. Um, so the student body's really ramping up for athletic success. Um, our pep rally on Friday uh, is, is a big, exciting thing. Um, and obviously for homecoming this weekend, uh, which can be awesome. Go, go Yellow Jackets. Um, aside from athletics, uh, clubs and student organizations are working really hard, and you see this really across the board um, with really any student groups, really working to build back the culture um, at the high school that was sort of lost during COVID. Um, I know in every group that I've been a part of, there's been a discussion, um, even without coaches or teachers present, just about like how do we get back to the place um, where we were before the pandemic sort of um, ended that passing down of, of culture and an atmosphere of, of groups and then of the school collectively. Um, and so you see that in groups. You also see that um, in sort of the, the institutions designed to keep a school culture. So the PL retreat was last, uh, left on Wednesday, came back on Friday. Um, it was super duper successful. The 24 seniors who were responsible for uh, leading groups of, of freshmen. Um, the, the senior group went up to the Taconic Outdoor up in uh, Cold Spring and did a bunch of team building games and went through a lot of training to make sure that uh, once we start working with the, the freshmen that we're going to be able to sort of um, kind of get them comfortable with high school culture and uh, revive this really awesome atmosphere that, that existed before COVID and that has been, you know, sort of managed to survive through COVID. Um, other than that, Project Share's uh, first midnight run uh, went off of that hitch um, last Saturday night, delivered about 200 meals uh, to homeless folks on the Upper West Side, um, as well as a bunch of food, toiletries, clothing, and of course, like a bunch of good conversation. Um, the pep band uh, and the band as a whole is working really hard to get ready for the pep rally for homecoming, um, which is gonna be an awesome event. Clubs uh, and school groups are planning on fundraising there. Um, and obviously, uh, a bunch of our sports teams are gonna be having home games. Uh, Hastings grads are invited to come back and, uh, you know, root for our teams, connect with old friends, and sort of get back into the, the culture of the district. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, on a slightly heavier note, um, seniors are in the thick of the college process. We had um, college meetings all this week. Uh, Twelfth graders are working with their counselors to get, you know, the Common App ready to finalize those lists of schools, um, recommendations, essays, all that, all that good stuff. Um, so that uh, when admission season rolls around, early decision is going to start in November and then regular decision in December, or sorry, in January, um, to make sure we're, we're ready to hit the ground running with that. Um, that's all I've got. Yeah, paired with the anticipation of homecoming, this week has been Spirit Week, um, organized by the Student Union. So Monday was Pajama Day, Tuesday was Today, Tacky Tourist Day, Wednesday is Spaghetti, we <laughs> Spaghetti Western Day. Thursday is anything but a backpack day, and Friday, of course, traditionally, are school colors. All, every grade is wearing a different color. Seniors wear their senior shirts. Juniors this year are wearing black, and the sophomores and the freshmen are the yellow and green, or gold and green. Um, and the school play is well underway. As Dr. Szymanski mentioned, Miss Yudis has joined our lovely theater community. And today we had, the actors had a little meeting with Miss Yudis, and everyone loves her, as expected. 
Um, the play is The Outsiders, and it's directed by Lori Walton. The auditions were this past Thursday and Friday, and today were the callbacks as well as tomorrow. About 40 kids auditioned, and everyone's very excited to be back past that COVID theater experience. You can't act with a mask, I can tell you that. Um, and the juniors have jumped right into the exciting, healthy stress of junior year. This past Saturday, there was a practice ACT and SAT. Um, the students had a choice of taking either one. And then there's another practice SAT and ACT on October 1st. And then over the past day, there have been code of conduct assemblies for all of the grades. Yesterday, there was the senior meeting, although they talked more about college preparation, I believe. I wasn't there. And today was the sophomore and the freshman one, basically talking a bunch about the basics. Everyone's very happy to be back. You guys are seeing this. You could be like a news anchor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just Very well done. Yeah. Right. Thank you. That was really Thank good. You. Does anybody have any comments or questions? I, I think we should just end the meeting now. I, of course, have a couple of questions. Yeah. This is going to sound very, yeah, so like, strong. I know, they're done. Um, the, this is going to sound very old fashioned, maybe, so I'm just curious. At homecoming, is there like, a, like a king and queen in a court, and do you do like a dance? No, that's like that we, so I'm we, like a 1980s. No, 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 no. I win. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it should be a reasonable question, um, <laughs> <laughs> but these things, right? Um, yeah. Dances got eliminated six or seven before we were in high school. Is um, this like Footloose? Do, what do, is do, yeah, no, do, <laughs> like, I think what? There, there were some sort of shenanigans that, that apparently, I don't know what happened. Pre Wait, us. They haven't been repeated. Um, there's some silence about it, but um, no, there's there's no dances. There's We have a lot of fun stuff at homecoming. There are going to be like booths and food and dunk tanks, and um, but no dances in your typical high school like King Queen stuff. I can add that there is, as per usual, um, junior Party. formal which uh, the preparation, the committee for that has already started meeting, and there's been a lot of um, debate about our theme. Um, but we're, so uh, I think it's November 7th is junior formal, so preparations are set to begin. And then Eliana, I have a question for you. Is it, I can't even believe this could be true, but is it The Outsiders, the musical? No, no, oh, no, no, okay. it's a play, it's <laughs> right. a play. All right, All right. thanks. <laughs> It would be really weird. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Real knives. <laughs> um, okay. If that's it, thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. We'll move on to public comments, and we don't have any public here, so I can just skip that, I think. Thank you, public. Um, so moving on to 6A business items, um, 1 through 12. Does anybody have any questions about business items 1 through 12? I was looking at item three, and uh, it's one of the, we have two uh, settlements mm -hmm. that are listed. Yeah. My brain didn't remember it, but of course, uh, we met about that in the years. Is that, uh, a while. The, many of these settlements uh, take a while. In, in this one, I, I that could help me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to assume. But it was one that we had planned for because it was in the reserve. So that's why we it knew was, it was yeah, a comment. Like, just kind of, sometimes it takes a while. Just add, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a question about number nine. What is the A plus tutoring contract? I didn't either. Oh, I, mean, I probably did. They're better than the B plus <laughs> right. tutoring. Oh, okay, and we so went in. C minus tutoring. We could only you. afford C minus tutoring. <laughs> we get it for a better deal. It says it's like a... Yeah, so, so I mean, many times I, I have to, I'll have to go back and see what this one, it actually probably came through. Remember, so, so they must have a student agency to secure this contract for. So we provide like one-on-one -on -one tutoring for some well, students they're sometimes? they're home typically, right? They're home bound. Sick, like a, we're with special uh, eligible for educational services. I see. Yeah. We can be providing. Got it. Yeah. Oh, it actually, it's it's because of their IEP. Yeah. Got it. Come through special ed office. But even when they're, right, even sometimes if a student um, is home, 
through like the guidance office if they're home for medical we do provide yep. services as well. And full I refund required, if yes. they don't get an A plus. Yes. <laughs> and then um I saw that I don't really have a question about it, the, the cafeteria for Hillside, the petty cash, whatever, that's fine. Yep. But um I was just wondering how it's has the cafeteria in Hillside opened? This no. year, so um, we're hoping. I mean, the plan is November one. Uh, October. Got it. We were shooting for either like late October or November one. It, you know, we're just um, just opening up any type of food service, but we also needed to have an inspection by the county in terms of um, just to operate a food service. It's just like part of the process. That that's um, like should be happening in the next few. Weeks. We, we're already like kind of setting up and anticipating. Once we have the date like solidified, we'll send things out. We're still um, going to bring like families together in terms of development of the menu. You know, there will be some like standard kind of recommendations, but then definitely an ability to um, you know provide input into what that may look like. Great, thank you. Can I ask a question about the sure. cafeteria? Yep. Um, how how will it work in terms of once the kids? You know, start using it. Do they get the card, and they is that how it's going to load that way, or you, are you going to expect the kids to actually the little ones to be bringing in money? Well, well, similar to what we had in place here, all students like they already have. Even prior to us having a cafeteria there, it, it's based on your student ID number, so that's what that's, um, that's what is we assign pins to everybody regardless, so they already have them. So um, in looking at Different districts how they they handle it you know many students even at the third or fourth grade most of the time it's a four-digit code um, the teacher could have the aid in the classroom I mean these are children that are assigned by classroom so um, what we've been told is that most of the time the students if if that's what the parent chooses can load the money onto the account and, and or send it a check or however um, I they can have use either option to put money on their students account and then the students, um, typically we would walk them through like a few times prior to like the opening. The, if we know we're going to open November 1, we start like mid-October kind of having the teachers work with the students. I, I remember that when we went to it here in fifth grade that that was kind of what they did at that time and kind of show them what the keyboard looks like. So that would be the thinking there. Um, I think some other districts do use like an ID of some sort. So we're, we're still kind of sorting out how we want to handle the younger grades and kind of speaking with the parents. So. That's um, because there are scanners too, so you can use a student ID. We, you know, if, if we think that's easier or more appropriate, we'll do that. Those, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, just a suggestion of a not, not to exceed. I know last time it came up with the budget, and some parents didn't know that there was kind of a, a fee, right? So there was a surprise from some yes. parents not realizing that the kids yes. were kind of had a tab running <laughs> without yeah, yeah. realizing. So I think I would definitely agree with a not to exceed or, you know, a balance that doesn't exceed a certain amount. Okay, it sounds good. Yes. No, I think um, I, I think that is a good thing because it does it does sneak up on you quickly. You know, <laughs> I mean, I think the little ones will be a little bit. They'll have like less access, but I but I think we'll we'll set up the accounts that way, and just so uh, parents don't get any surprises. For the board to discuss at some point uh, last year, we did have uh, one meeting where we talked about how much of a negative balance mm -hmm. can go on and. Uh, that trade-off between trying not to uh, shame. a little bit shame to families, uh, stopping them, and also just making sure our students get enough energy to get to the end of the day, versus what we thought was reasonable for our families, and we're, we were only speaking about the ones that didn't qualify for completely free lunch, but we talked about the fluidity of families that are uh, that had financial stress. But that's an interesting point because as we try to be aware and generous and let the balances go negative, we also are allowing a, a, a trap to open up there. You know, whether we wanted to uh, bring it up significantly, something we might, uh, I don't know if it's a, it's a micromanaging issue and if we should back out of it, but. Uh, well, it's kind of a policy issue and that's where I think it was brought up, I think because there are, I mean, I see it both ways. I mean, my my thinking is I'd rather have it higher because once you set that rate, I can't just like have a discretion to say, you know, this family, like even if we know something about a family sort of 
there could be a time where somebody may say, like, you know, right now I'm not working, but I'm going to be back to work, or, you know, for whatever that were different reasons that they may not have received money. It could be, I hate to say it, like a child. It could be anything. And, and we, I, we hear those things time to time where maybe someone may need to go up to 300 and which is not hard ne to do. Negative 300. Negative. It could happen. I mean, I've seen it. So, but then the flip side is then the parent who is in a way is running up charges. But the one thing that parents do have the ability to do is to put restrictions on their own children's accounts. And that has always existed. So there's parents who... For the negative amount? No, no, for, for either. They can do it um, restricting their, their student from buying certain items, like a la carte. You can just have them only be able to order meals and not be able to purchase like drinks and snacks and things like that. And there are parents that do it, and I guess their child knows it, so they're not going to try to come through and do Correct. it. So it isn't unheard of for people to do that, and that's how they, I guess, manage so much of spending. Um, I mean, that's where it's always tricky because you do have some, it could be maybe 10 families that may have that need occasion and go higher, but whatever that policy is, then it, we have to adhere to it and, and put that lock on to everybody's account. Oh, is my, it, is it, oh, sorry, go ahead. my impression was that uh, bringing it up to even just uh, a much lower number of $20 was uh, something that I thought I could support in this community. Um, Specifically, I think we had the we had a five-digit uh, number, so it's it's got to be a significant number of families or students that are uh, not prioritizing uh, making that choice. I think we had uh, just under twenty thousand dollars, possibly eighteen thousand. Uh, eighteen thousand. Yeah, but I uh, remember. I hesitate. I, if policy committee sounds like a good place to start a discussion. Those are open meetings, of course, to our public as well. And if uh, if a need arises, uh, or it maybe it would come. If it's documented through, like there could be an exception if it's you might have the through, yeah. like even you know occasionally things come to me through the, not even the parent but through staff that either works with the child. I'd be really uh, yeah. I'd be really supportive yeah, of that correct. of our administrators having an ability to uh, to go to a second level, but that the first first level maybe would stop correct. much higher. I think that we had we did talk about this work. in the policy committee. Um, it actually started from there. Yes, it did. So we talk about it, and I I think that it's more. Um, and so, as parents, we one of the things that we saw was that even this eighteen thousand debt was mainly negligence, not. Necessary people, yeah. some of it, not all of it, um, not because people don't have that the money to pay it. So then, so there's that part, and then there's a part where again you don't want to be shaming, even if they have the money to pay, and the child is like, I'm gonna get something. But I like the fact that parents, I wasn't aware of this. Parents can restrict their choices. Then I remember Jeremy, you said that you don't have a problem shaming yours, but if right. parents, if my <laughs> sons. Uh... No, well, if my credit, if I forgot to update my credit card, I'd like to, <laughs> he can tell me on the first day, hey, Dad, <laughs> exactly. I, I got shut out, you yeah. messed up. But and, I mean, it's real it hard, right? Though. We don't have, you don't have the ability to go into a supermarket and Correct. get a tab. So I think, I don't see it as shaming. I see it as like you're teaching them reality yeah. and you give the, some sort of a heads up. Yeah. One warning or whatever, and it run up to $10 or whatever, $20. Correct. So, so that's anyway, a process we I talked about. about. Like, this isn't on the agenda right now. Like, I know that we're, we have like other topics that I think are gonna take a long time. This Tonight? isn't even an agenda item right now. So I, I'm just trying, I think we just need to keep discipline in, because there's lots of topics I could raise too that I find fascinating. Like, But I think we need to like one through 12, look at it, is there something that needs to be discussed here? And that, if that's a topic, should be put on another agenda for, for discussion. Yeah, I guess you can motivate for us to do that, but I think that according to the law, when we are, we are not even supposed to have an agenda for a board meeting, but so if colleagues want to throw in something, they may, I mean, I'm not, no, no, let me just land what I'm saying. I'm just saying that Maureen was bringing some ideas that sometimes the ideas come at the spur of the moment, but I, 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 I agree with what you're saying, but I don't think that you should, it should be just shut down like that. You can just caution like we cautioned earlier that we could move ahead, but I, I don't think it's, we should just, Throw it off like that. Like the only thing I want to say is that I think you are 
April 19th meeting, that policy 3505, because it had come as a suggested revision from the state policy, mm -hmm. from NISBA, and just looking at it, it seems like there's a built-in limitation of $100, and I don't remember if that's set an item, an amount that we set at that meeting, or if that was one that we, like, was that the pre-existing one, or is that what we agreed to at that 19th? I, I think it was I'm just the, looking at yeah, it right the now. Yeah, the amount so. I think we agreed to at that meeting. Okay, that's what I thought. But it was, it was that, the shaming, and I think it's also, that came from the state because the they state, wanted to discuss that. But I think we've yeah. never yes. shamed here, and I think there was part of why it even we started the government thing is right. there were people who, what you get is this case and a communication issue that we need to make sure that we're letting parents know that there was this sense that, like, um, that even, quite frankly, there was some of our children that are actually on the free and reduced lunch, they wanted to have access to all the a la carte, and I'm like, that's not how it works. And then there was, I guess, some conversation and that led them to believe that they could run up the tab and we were like that was part of there was a discussion where some parents thought lunch shaming was not allowing their children to take ever I mean, that's sort of where there was some discussion around it too so that some of those balances also just families that felt as though that they should have access and they were worried that if their child didn't have the ability to take different items which are get all the food we we're very different than most schools because we're not in the program. So we have a lot more fun. We don't restrict people to certain lunches, but we, we don't let people just like the snack, or whatever those drinks are, like those are an all part item. And we were finding it where some people could, whatever. It, it was, that was a part of it also, like how much money it was, many of our balances were from children that were on the program that also wanted access to that, but that was where some of that balances came from. And then when we would say something, we, we got, we were actually like pulled out for it. So that's why there is some sensitivity and I don't want to put the cashiers actually quite frankly are put in the front lines of that. And that becomes a very, it's very challenging to be honest with you. Right. I, I just yeah. brought that up to say that we Thank did you. discuss this in the spring. No, we and did. We had a, yes. a couple of robust conversations. I'm yeah. not saying that, but I'm just saying if we want to revisit it, we can also see like whatever it was that we discussed at yeah. that point in time and if we want to tackle it again. Yeah. Like I mean, everything in the policy yeah. committee, it's all from like, NISBA policy manual right. revisions that they want us to tackle, and so that's why it came on our. Well, we added the money. Right, exactly. Yeah. But I'm just saying that that's how it came to. And I'm not looking to extend this conversation. I'm just trying to give that historical context of when we talked about that's it last. That's helpful, Sylvia. That's helpful. I yeah, couldn't you, remember Sylvia. the dates, and I'm peeking at it now. Thank I you. think that the the one thing that's clear from this conversation is that the we need to fix the communication to the community about what the lunch program actually is. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could have, if it's on the website very clearly laid out, mm -hmm. then maybe on one of the dailies, we could have Jackie add a link that says, you know, like the, the program and have it here. Because mm -hmm. um, I know I looked when I got Ms. Sparelli's email about, you know, like back to school and it wasn't included in that. So it would just be, I like, I didn't know where to look myself. Mm -hmm. So if we could include that. I think okay. the communication to the parents about Sorry. them and all of that would be mm -hmm. terrific. Um, well, even if it's, it's probably exists someplace, but we, just we to remind want to keep moving here. Yeah. I, I want to so. say one thing um, to me. Um, so can we send, can the policy committee meet on this? That way we know that we are not just talking it and leaving it here and then we revisit it again. Like Sylvia said, there's been a robust conversation. So I think let's take it back to the, um, policy committee for us to sort of go through it and land so that now we have a policy and everything that Fair. at least we can bring back here. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So can we vote now on business items 1 through 12? I do a motion. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next item is item 6B, um, placement services for CSE and CPSC. I think we just um, vote on it. So do I have a motion to approve the it's probably worth just for Maureen just to understand uh, this one, okay. Maureen. So there's, na there's no names. It's a weird formality that we have to vote on something where we have no real <laughs> ability to know what those are because they're numbers, but it's a formality that we have to do. So new board members find it strange sometimes. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> new superintendents from other states, but, uh, right, right. 
right. So do I have numbers there though? Um, business item six B. Second. All in favor? I, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to comment that I'm happy to see in items in B3 that we're able to retain our um, wonderful Melissa then about it up to keep her to serve now as the confidential hey, interim secretary Melissa. to our chief school officer. So hey, congratulations. Thank you. And for your continued service to the board. And to throw it out, uh, obviously, a lot of hiring uh, beginning of the year. So it's nice to see so many appointments and uh, okay. amendments. Um, Mike Uraka's wife, did she deliver like yes. today? Yeah, like uh, two hours ago. About oh, five wow. minutes before we entered executive session. That's baby girl. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm just curious with the leave of absence. Um, I remember last time it was a lot of COVID. Um, when we were looking at it, is is the COVID factor still there or? For some, but not all. For sure. You can kind of go when it's a few days. That's what like the, the typically the COVID and um, COVID leaves are the, the NL. They have the NYS CPL. It's like mm. New York State COVID paid leave. That's what. Okay, got it. The C, they got the C in it. The C, the C in it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve item 7A through D? So moved. Second. Second. All Aye. Okay. Um, we have the minutes from the meeting from August 23rd. Any questions? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes items 8A? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Um, moving on to new business, Portrait of a Hastings Learner. Um, to our students, you're welcome to stay and, and listen to the rest of it. I know it's, it's getting a little bit late, but um, if you're interested in, in this topic or any others, you're certainly welcome to stay, but we understand if you need to go. We're going to have to <laughs> bail today. But. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> Thank we you. You're welcome. Um, you, can, you can leave your devices, please. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's not even official devices. Well done. Thank you. And yes. yes very Welcome well. and thank you. Um, As Maureen said, the only entertaining part of no, the you were great. <laughs> <laughs> not not Maureen, I'm, not like, I'm like interim presi president here. I mean, you got to give me a little bit of credit. <laughs> right? It's tough to compare, <laughs> tough to, compare <laughs> to the energy. <laughs> okay. Now we want to talk about um, the portrait of a Hastings learner, which I know we're all super excited about. Um, this is about selection. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the selection process to date, Dr. McCarthy? Um, sure. Well, the, and the, this is specifically about. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, jump in, Alex. Yeah, go ahead. No, Alex. we just, you know, we just sort of figured, well, you know, see who would sign up if we had more than the number of, of spots, and then we would just make a random selection. Um, you know, one thing we, Bill and I have been talking about the, as the, the conception of the core team moved along the past really six weeks or so, when the task that they were tasked with came into focus um, on a personal level, and when I put out today to everybody's email, I just felt that Doug's uh, experience and perspective from managing, especially the bond, because the bond for all of us who remember that and the messaging around it, that was a real heavy lift. And uh, I just thought that his skill would really be beneficial to that, to the where where the, the what are we calling it, POHL, is at at the moment. And so the two board spots that were going to be part of this 25 person 
core group, and I felt like it would be reasonable to have Doug fill one of those spots, and then to have the other spot be a random drawing. So, in random drawing, I wanted to throw that out there as, from my perspective, seeing what I've seen as a more, um, more creative part of the process. So, I just want to open up for discussion uh, if people are comfortable with that or, or what, what we should do as a board. Well, one thing I'll say there is, I, well, I appreciate that, Alex. I also um, uh, am 50-50 on those days. I have a client that's requested me on those days, so, um, but it's like a loose request, um, so that may throw a monkey wrench in your face. <laughs> as much as I've been a part of this for seven years and would love to help out, um, and I certainly would. Well, Alex and Doreen, can I throw it out then? Uh, I know we, uh, we never, we never try to go to four board members on any committee because that would uh, be a conflict of a majority rule. Is there a, is the choice of two, was that Judy's recommendation? If we had two and an alternate who would come in, is that a bad idea, Bill? And I know we're not talking about Portrait of Hastings Learner right now, we're just talking about Selecting two, Doreen or Alex, uh, anything you could throw I, I, at my I, I way there? I have the best perspective on that because I, I, I have not spoken to Judy myself. No, not right. It's not yeah, our role. Yeah, so I, um, a lot of discernment's gone on for every other person, and it's not been random at all. It's been very carefully thought through, and there'll be an invitation that goes out. You may recall that quite intentionally an invitation yep. so that nobody feels. You're the only group that has a potential feeling of rejection. <laughs> you have, you know, more involved potentially in wanting very specifically and directly. Uh, but, you know, even right up to today, some uh, modifications. So the 19th, a letter of invitation will go out from me uh, to a, a very good, it's, a, it's, a, it's emerging as a very good group if everyone accepts the invitation. For the board, uh, would be, if you need to get to three, you could get to three. You can't go to four, obviously. Um, you know, the dynamic, I think, preferred, but three is three. You know, I think this plus is, an alternate. I, I think needs to make the decision on. Um, you know, once you've decided, you know, you know you'll know who's invited, if you will. Thank you. So, well, then I would jump in. Uh, uh, Alex, I hope it's okay. With Judy's advice today was one, everyone else, it's not been random. It's been a discernment process, very definite. And if you need to get to three, though, to help you, the, the numbers are such that would work. Very so, important, though, it is two full days of work, and we need everybody to be there. So, whomever it is, well, that's what it was. Any the, category, if they can't commit to barring illness. But that's what I was wondering. Could it be two with an alternate? where if somebody's, uh, you know, coming in, how disruptive that would be. Yeah, well, so then, uh, Alex, as to what you propose for the board to discuss, uh, um, the same reasoning that would make me, uh, you know, feel very comfortable with Doug in that group, and uh, it is a rejection to the others who volunteered. I would, uh, I would hesitate to go with uh, a random selection my instincts would be uh, a lot of the qualities that Doug's uh, six years or seven years, depending if you count the, the remote years, uh, bring to the committee. I, I would see a lot of the same attributes with Sylvia. Uh, so I don't know if people, uh, it's a tough one because five of you did more than step forward and then say you'd give uh, during the day, you know, work. My instinct would be that... Uh, a random poll has its benefits, you know, for how our board might uh, handle the rejection, as Bill put it. But uh, my my interests would be to to put two people who I've been, uh, you know, watching on the board, and uh, they've been involved in a couple aspects deeper than me for longer than I have uh, in this aspect of uh, the school process, but. Uh, I understand why you would throw out the uh, one name and a and a straw poll for the other. I would wonder if anyone would comment uh, in a different direction as to just uh, taking the two senior ones in this case and 
not trying to make that precedent for any other committee. I think this is a very one-off issue here, yeah, but I, maybe I'm wrong. In it. Okay. Sure. If I could add a little bit of texture, you know, what, what this group is doing is working out the process of how the town is going to be queried. So just to keep, just to keep what we're discussing in perspective, it's, you know, the two board members are each about 4% of the, the core group. But they're only handling a small portion of the intake of information. And there's a whole long road of output which we're going to have other significant opportunities to be involved in as a board. So I just want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about here. It's a piece of a piece. Can, so. can you clarify that? Maybe Bill, you know as well. So 27 people in a row is always tough, I guess is the most... Uh, <laughs> the kindest way to put it. That's my life. Uh, and um, maybe you could just paint the picture for how those two days get spent by that full group. Yeah, again, we're leaning on the expertise of Judy here in particular, who's done this now in multiple places. Um, it'll be, you know, staying true to the work day, the teacher day, the school work day. Uh, two full days. Uh, it will be looking at the survey results, and, not, and surveys are a guide. They're not a vote. They're one piece of information. We'll be looking at the survey results that she will have pulled together into themes and all the rest. Um, then, you know, I, juxtaposing that to other ways that get input in small groups, interactive, trying to, through the two days, at the end, come with, to a real outline of what's emerging is you know, several of the top focus areas for the portrait in Hastings and then begin to map out, okay, fine, you've got these gelling areas of focus that are coming to the surface, three, four. I'm going to make one up. You know, quantitative reasoning should be really something that's a signature for in the Hastings learner. Uh, let's just stop there. I mean, I, I can go Project-based learning. You know, project-based learning, you know. Um, you know, you think about the wonderful strengths of the two here in our room, and just kind of something about them and that quality, what would that be? And then, but very important is beginning then not to resolve in those two days, but what then, how do you get to the action steps? Because Judy has said quite intentionally, this there has to be 18 month action plan steps attached to that. And that's not all getting figured out in two days. But I think it's a sense of what are those top three or four major areas of focus, and then beginning to start to build out what are the action steps. Okay. Um, and I've not been in the process with her, uh, just reported out from others as to how it works. But I think it is a piece of a piece, as Alex said. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's got to be a pretty productive couple of days to get something that's really workable. So um, if I would add, so I'm listening in, in this process. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, I'm thinking of a more standardized randomization of selecting. Because if we are going to be fair in how we select, even we are talking about the portrait of the Hastings Liner that represents our community, we have to be intentional about how we even do our selection if it's not casting the net to the broader um, diverse group that we embody. So if in, I, I hear, I mean, each, we can speak to the expertise of each person here. And uh, if we, we don't take care, and I know how this has worked in other places, we may just, again, psychologically weigh to certain areas more than other areas, and then lose sight of the fact that we have to use an equi equitable approach. So in saying that, to make the selection easier, I don't have a problem stepping down, but I still would like that this would be an equitable selection, not something that we w we are vying for each other. Um, that way it's, it's a fair process because that's important. If it's, it feels like you are talking this up, you are talking this person down, we are trying to it, if I personally, I like to just say things as I think it. So it's, it's okay. I mean, we, I totally would like, um, that's, that's Doc's work of expertise, you know, organizational stuff. So, I, I mean, he's saying that he may be busy, but I wouldn't mind that 
but there should be one old, one new. People came with fresh ideas, you know what I mean? So you can't belittle it because there's only old that we are resorting to. So I hear the conversations happening, I hear the arguments happening, um, but I feel like at the end of the day, we, we, from the understanding was draw a straw, um, the old fashioned put numbers, pick a random number, that, that kind of thing. Then if someone is like, I think that we are ha after that, when you, we say that, I think it's just too many new people, then there is a change that is happening. So let's, let's start with a fair equitable process first before we, we land. And if, if it happens that, I'm saying this public, if it happens that probably in the random draw, I get drawn and dog is not on there because I, I do, I mean, he started the conversation about the portrait of a graduate. I will totally defer and give, me, give him his number, but let's do a fair process. I could share one thing that may be helpful from what Judy has said. And in some ways, your your role in the room is difficult because you have to be in there not as you but as a board member. Correct. You have to be in there sort of even if it's two of you, how are you representing the group of seven? Um, I mean, you're truly still in that governance role. You're still in that oversight role. And so you're not there as a board member with a particular view as opposed to representing the Hastings board. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I think in one way to interpret what Alex is saying, this is definitely for you as a board one piece of a larger whole. You're going to be involved in every other step later at key decision points, um, even to the point of saying, okay, fine, we see what you've done. We, we're not, I'm going to go to the blunt. We're not satisfied. We, can you rethink this? Can you rework this? Um, and you're going to be in the authority position, unlike anyone else in the room, later to say that. So it's, it's almost where the board role in one of these w groups is acting some, but it's almost, it may be moments probably providing some guidance and sounding board, but knowing how does this keep moving? Do you see what I'm trying to say here? Yeah. You know, because you, you're going to have multiple opportunities, uh, but you're really a member of a larger group. Uh, and so is what other opportunities would be coming because this one has the word core in it. You know, is this, you know, when you put a core group and you 25, it seems like other opportunities would be smaller. Would that be fair to say? Well, I mean, good, I think it, Judy it, is going to try to meet with all of us, maybe. Oh, yeah, so there's, there's, I mean, we have acts. Oh, yeah, so sorry. There are one on interviews with a range right. of people, but certainly with board members. I, I mean, the, the core group is sort of. It, it, the center group trying to begin, bring out recommendations, the, the, the outlines, and then you know there'll be a lot of critique and commentary on is this the right set of outlines? Is this the right type of approach? And Thank then it, it's going to be iterative. Um, and in core, and I can, they, everything gets politicized at some level, right? So core group, oh, that's a political meeting. You know, <laughs> kind of, you know, well, who's then, in the room, you know, and who's not in the room. Okay. But no, it's not that, but it could be. you in president vice president but i like the idea what damaris was saying with you know not straying too far from equitable Mitty, i'm not sure sylvia how you might have decided it when you were vice president if four people had asked to be on the finance committee we have pulled numbers from a hat and would you know or if it would have been it doesn't sound equitable if the president or vice president makes a decision, but then again, we don't really give you guys much more, you know, power. We do entrust you to meet with our administration so that we're not all, you know, running to get an hour meeting with uh, Melissa and Bill every day. So I, uh, I definitely could understand Damaris's idea. If five people put their names in the hat, do we have any other role besides numbers in a hat? And Sylvia, if you could speak to anything in the past, or it probably never has happened that four wanted on a committee. No. Okay, <laughs> that's what I was afraid <laughs> of. The arm wrestling. Yeah, the arm exactly. wrestling would be it's very more, bad. I have a bad elbow. So this would be a rare, this would be a rare. Melissa, Melissa I understand, right? Right. So no, Damaris, this would be the way, you know, like this would be that first committee where five 
stepped forward and I understand, I, I like the way you phrased it and I, uh, I could understand why uh, other people might say, uh, Jeremy, I don't want you uh, advocating for <laughs> Doug and Sylvia that maybe we should just go with uh, the randomness. Yep. I would think, uh, because it's got that word core in it, I would want uh, two people who ran for uh, two terms, uh, real continuity there. But uh, could be another 6-1 vote. <laughs> <laughs> three terms, three terms. So, I mean, I ah, have, one of them was a I, small I one. I have a couple of thoughts. <laughs> As someone who deeply honors process, I can say to you, um, you know, we definitely picked administrators, you know, and, and administrators are all very competent in this district, but there were reasons why we said we think that right. this is the right thing to do. And the team knows that they're the team. And they know that whomever goes in there is representative and they're gonna represent the group. And you know, people will take it very well. I already know that. Like it's it's gonna be good. I think that the challenge is the trust in the process to know that it's gonna be it's gonna come back. It's it go Bill used the word iterative. It's going to come back. So these are two days and it's a moment. And the way that Judy described it is we'll be looking at data. We'll be looking at feedback that we're getting so that we can set some goals and we can set a trajectory. But the work won't stop with two days and everybody in the entire system has to own this work. It's really, really important. Um, the second thing that I just want to from a place of perspective is um, I, you know, we, we did set timelines for this work, and so I'm sharing that because it feels like we always have time, but we need to keep our foot firmly on the gas pedal with this. So by Monday, we need that team ready to rock. So that will allow us to be able to communicate well, to make sure that we've got, you know, coming out so that we get So, um, is it somewhat of an, you know, an artificial And so one of the things I like is to keep a fast-based perspective moving forward. So, I say that from a place of, you know, just deep respect for every single person at this table, and also knowing that whomever sits has to be, because this whole thing is about making sure we have good representation of every single constituent group, voice representing a lens, and then being able to depersonalize it and think as a system so that we can then move forward with goal setting and planning. So I'm just putting out you know, the, the nitty gritty date piece gently just to say I honor process and I believe in it and I believe that there are reasons for every single person at this table to sit on it. And even if it ends up being one person, I still think that whomever it will be will really honor that like we're all in this. Date-wise, I think we were considering doing this tonight, right? Yeah, I think so. not, not running it tonight. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Oh, okay. I thought it was tonight. That's what I was yeah. saying. Melissa, this, D I thought we were, make you know, some a, numbers. This open uh, discussion and, you know, definitely locking it up tonight. Whether or not you would do a hat pull some other time. Yes, we're not doing that on camera. Oh, not today? Okay. But no, we're no, no, deciding. Got it, got it. Melissa, Melissa D has a, a process. Very, very attractive random number generator. Not random number. Her name is like a um, <laughs> right wheel. And it spins around and oh, wow. Oh, actually, it's, 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 yeah. it's a gamble. It's a game. Oh. Are we using technology and not just like <laughs> picking it out of a hat? Randomly selecting. All right. Do you want to make a. Do yeah. other people want to talk or do you want to make a motion on how we're going to deal with this story? I think, I mean, I personally think that anybody who in this room could do the job. Like if at the job is to represent the board, I think any one of us could do that um, and do it well and listen to the other board members and figure out what That's the other important. board members want to do. I get what you're saying about Doug and uh, you know the, the history of it and I think that that um, is important too and I hear that, but I think that the only way, um, I think the only way to do it is to be, to be fair is to pull a name out of a hat. 
It's not that I don't think Sylvia could do it. I totally get that. But I think DeBaris could do it. I think Alex could do it. Obviously, I think I could do it because I want to do it, you know, put, put my name in. So I think the only fair way is to do that. Okay. So from just from what I'm sort of sensing, you know, especially the fact that it might not be even doable for Doug, I like Dr. Lang's idea then we can, we can move forward with a random drawing. I think we keep it to two seats. Uh, and then to Dr. Lang's idea, we, we, we draw two and then we can make our personal judgment. Correct. So, you know, if, I, if I'm one, one, and I might say, you know, hey, you know, I'm going to I think we just move forward. We'll I don't think I don't think that down. works because whoever steps back is going to be. Uh, I mean, we're trying to do it on a timeline. Then I'm going to put my name in the hat. No. And then if would. I win, I'll step back and I'll uh, pick my own replacement. Yeah, I'm not sure that that works. Really. Yeah, Alex. I think, I think just that, those. I think the ones who the names who volunteered get pulled should get yeah. pulled. Yeah. Correct. And the question is, if we have Doug and then three others, and Correct. then Doug and then the others yeah because if if dog name doesn't get pulled i personally would love him to be there but let it be a choice that way let the fair process happen but like i publicly announced if let's say the pulling straw dog doesn't pull i will step down if if i get to pull because i think he should be part of it but i don't want my thinking to be the way that we should go i will i would rather go through an equitable process that recognizes everybody else's potential within mm -hmm. something that we are representing governance process. This is not administrative versus faculty. Maris, can I ask you a question then? Yeah. Is there an interest in this, uh, you know, our of doing uh, what was written about, you know, that we were thinking about? Is there an interest in doing one selection and one randomization? Would that not fit with uh, where you're fit. thinking equitab equitably wise? Or uh, to, f uh, to answer well, your no, question. I won't go there. If Maureen <laughs> voted and we got uh, Sylvia and Doug and myself, thinking. we could do a majority that way without uh, being recognized. Is there an interest in putting that out there? Uh, one and then. I will answer, what would your, you question. Thank I'll answer you, your question. Thank you, Dr. Lang. I just, I just think that, and, and I'm, I'm right there with process, because this is being documented. This is a seven membership that is shared governance. Vice, vice president and president is not like above any of us. It's a, it's a, it's a um, procedural officiating position, so they can't even make an executive decision. That's right. not their prerogative. So that being said. I, I feel like let's just, like Melissa D has a spinning wheel, let's just get it done because they need to get going with this process, which is so important. And, and like I said, yes, I personally want Doug on there because he has a skill, but let's just do those names. It was, I for think- For both positions, that would yeah, be- Yes, your, for, that three, would be for three positions, like it's all two positions two for now. You would want to spin the wheel for both spin of them? Spin the wheel for the three or two that we are going to decide on, and then let's take it from Doreen, there. Doreen, is that Simple. where you're at as well? You want to spin the wheel for both of them? Um, I'm not, I'm not Because sure. we can make up our own process here. Yeah. That's what we do in but our meetings Alex, here. do you have a thing you want to- no, I, I just wanted to point out that, you know, I wasn't trying to make it any sort of big decision. I just thought, from seeing what I've seen, that we, I just want to put it out there. I wanted us to discuss it. Because, you know, I wanted us to see what we value individually. If we don't discuss it otherwise, mm -hmm. this is the only opportunity to do it. So I'm comfortable either way. My recommendation, you know, like as I said, I thought we would have Doug in one spot and random drawing in the other. But I'm also comfortable doing a random drawing across the two slots. I don't think we should go to three. I think two is, is fine. So I think that I've heard from us that we're comfortable with that. Maureen and Sylvia, are you okay with that? With what? A so Doug and a random selection of somebody else. Yeah, I could definitely support that. Yeah. And Doug, do you feel like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that the role is to represent the board and it's, it's a facilitative role. I see it as a facilitative role to facilitate what the board is interested in. The only thing I'm trying to read through her stuff right now is I'm trying to figure out the actual process of how it's going to occur on those two days to understand do we get pre-reads 
do we, are we are we thinking through the topical stuff? Is it just delivered to us that Monday morning? I, there's just some logistical. I mean, I facilitate groups like this for a living, so <coughs> I have opinions on how it works well, and I'm trying to figure that out because, you know, if you're just dumped with stuff in the morning, you get 25 people talking, probably any of us could do that because you know the process has a life of its own. If you're seeing some, I mean, I think one of the values here is you're going to have you're going to have way more things come in that we're going to have the ability to invest in in this district. And there's going to be a tough prioritization process that's going to occur in that room, like all these things have. And, um, you know, I, I, I enjoy that work. That's what I do. So, But if we don't get that in advance, it's going to be really hard. I think she's a professional, and she's probably very aware of that problem and that challenge. But Doug, what you never spoke to was, would you prefer? Yeah, I, would look, you prefer I, two selections? What I suggested. Would you prefer we? I mean, I, look, I, I, it's hard for me to say. I, I want to do it, but. You know. And Sylvia, you're not going to speak to that. Whether you prefer two selections or a spinning wheel for uh, your spot. You I know? don't. I don't have a strong feeling about it. When we, I mean, I think the reality of it, we're going to be one in a group of 25. There's not going to be a lot of opportunity to shape like the that conversation, I think. I think, you know, like at least in other capacities that I've served in in the, in the board, it's really to like absorb and to report back to the board what's going on. And get, if this is going to be like two full days of doing this, I think so much of it is going to be actually like the dynamics of what's happening in the, rule, in the room. And in my own, I would see this as not being in any way an advocacy position, right? It's much more like absorbing, reporting to the board, and also representing what the role, what the board's perspective is going in there, not my own perspective, right. because mm -hmm. that's yeah. what's important. So to the extent, I mean, I, I would like to think that all of this would be equally neutral going into that room, right? But I don't know that it's, you know, I'm not going to die on the hill if I can't do it by God. No, it's, you know, whoever can do it, you know, I happen to be available those two days, so that's why I threw my hat, in, you know, like that's how a lot of things work, right? Are you actually available for that chunk of time? And I am. And, I, you know, I have a kid who's gone through the system for 12 years, so I also feel like as a parent, you know, I've seen a lot of things, like as a parent, but also as somebody who served on the PTSA board and has, you know, had the opportunity to field a lot of um, concerns from the parent side, you know, up to the administrators before I served in this capacity, and so that's why I thought, you know, I could make a reasonable representative for this board, so, but I'm happy to have yeah. others serve. So now, listening to Sylvia, if, if I'm so, I feel I'm like so shifting sorry. it back to Sylvia <laughs> from Doug. This is crazy. I can't be persuasive. Maybe, but maybe Sylvia we might should do be. three and have Sylvia and Doug. And uh, why not three? Why are we restricting to two and then pull a hat for Or let's pull the three straws. For the third? I love, I love, okay, I'll make a suggestion. Maris, I love that idea. You love that idea? Okay. Yeah, I love a little I strong. Should, I like it. Yeah, yeah, I think we should make it fair and just pull the straws. Yeah, I think so. For everybody? Yes. I disagree. For I think this should be a selection. I like the idea of uh, two people plus the straw for the third. Judy's you, you, also in favor of selecting. Judy's in favor of select. I think that's good to, to handle this. I like uh, Damaris' last comment, if I understood it. Uh, unless there's somebody who wants to step back, of the five of you, if anybody wants to step back and increase the percentage. I like that idea of uh, we put three in there, yeah. and we, we select two, and for equity we make, uh, we do a, it could be Alex, Doreen, or Damar, Dr. Lang for the third. So, so Is let there me, anyone who would? Uh, I think um, three I is have, a fine idea, it's a good idea. idea. It's, this is a big group. The, we will be broken up. We won't even That's be together. That's what I want. Right. Yeah. The three of us. Uh, so I don't think it really matters. So, so yeah. I want to ask whether, um, if I may, because you are the officiating. So my original plan is let's just do the straw and then let's land. And I will default to, to, to um, Doc. But now I see this strong suit. So if we all agree, again, this is a democratic process. If we all agree, I, number one, I feel um, um, Sylvia and Doug have the, what do you call it, the history with them, with the school system as well. So that is enriched, enriching with the goes on. So then um, I, I, I am, I, although my original preference was just throw, throw all the three in there because we're just gobbling, gobbling with one, now that it's two strong suits, I would suggest that if we all agree, 
that these two are, are there, then let's do the last one. And, and, and among the three newbies that came because Maureen, your name wasn't there. Yep. So we, we, we are the, the three That's newbies true. that are very, the so it's between, exactly. The 2021ers. 2021 right. is that. Are there two, are there two other people who would uh, sort of speak to that item? Going to three people, one of them being a very equitable straw. Damaris and I are already on that level. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fine. That sounds fine. That'd only be three, though. Sounds, it sounds fine with me. I agree as well. You know, I, I think it's a good mix. It'll, be, it'll end up as a good mix. So okay. That. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to do three. three. Between the three of us, one, two, three, and there'll be a, one. there'll be a, a spin whether it happens now or afterwards. It doesn't seem to have to happen in public uh, afterwards for whether it's. Yeah. Yeah. Do the we have the spin around. Do the live action. Spin away. Can you, can you action. You spin. <laughs> okay, you got it as a two personer. Okay, you got a three. Spin, right, take me out. Wait, wait, wait. I have something to you say. So now spin. In. No. Listen, they are the VPs, and, and the, this they is perfect. They already got access. Stay so in. So I'm stepping down. Oh. No, stay in. I just stay in? Okay. Stay in. Let's just to move. see. I was going to get yeah, it. Just to shake it up. Okay. Equitable. Stay in, please. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So how does it work, Melissa? They get a number or something? No, it's, it's, it's just it's, our names are on it. Oh, the names. And what is it? On. Whoever lands on t Is it Your activating now? Is it slowly? <laughs> There we go. It's there go. And what's it on? Who's ever on the right Alex, side? Is it like Alex, is it? Yeah. Alex, you Alex! 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 Thanks. Doreen, like thank you for the conversation. The right. Let's, yeah, okay. I, I really want to thank everybody. You know, it's our topic. <laughs> Sorry. Really He's like, what the so crazy. Okay. So uh, can, can we move speech, on to Alex? the thank you? We've got it. I want to say thank you too because I have closure now. So just right. <laughs> so like for officially, spot, Melissa, spot I think we can say that it's Alex, Alex, Alex uh, Sylvia, Doug, and Sylvia. Yeah. And, okay. And Adding that, I will be talking with Judy tomorrow about two big questions here: of what's, what, what's, what are people getting ahead of the two days, and when might you get a, a sense of what the two days is? Great. Um, which I'm also in the doing invite. Doing thematic analysis ahead of time would be very helpful. Yeah. I think I feel sorry for Judy having Doug in it because no, <laughs> he he's, a, he's a safe expert. He's gonna be like, he's wait, we should be doing it this way. Yes. So. Um, Okay. We only got four more items. So we can move on. And then, Doug, as soon as you find out, you let us know, and then we'll spin yeah, the wheel again. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, okay. Well, I wanted to get the roll so that I actually got the business, because that's Murphy's Law, right? Right, so. totally. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But are you, are you, you are going to work out your schedule, schedule thing? Yeah, I mean, there's a 10% chance that a big client calls me and says, I want you to come. To so then something. the default right. would be Doreen, I guess, yeah. because I, would, I wouldn't move my... spin again. We spin, we spin again, again. no. Spin again. <laughs> Doesn't have I'll to be in public. Right. I'm moving on to old business. That was new business. Okay, thanks. I think we're all set with that. Um, item 10, old business, the BOE meeting topics calendar. I think we've all seen it already yeah, just in the previous. Might, just flag a couple adjustments. And again, this is a working document, so it's never final, as you know. Uh, but on the, the 28th, um, we're assuming that we will have an executive session for you, something related to the HTA contract. That's in process. We'll see. That's still an open question. Uh, and then there'll be uh, potentially then, but maybe actually may bump to the October meeting, uh, personnel matters regarding non-represented staff raises, because that, that would all be retroactive. Um, the other thing, just uh, June on the 11th of October, uh, I think Melissa war advised you in an email, that's your required code of conduct public hearing. The policy committee will be looking at uh, recommended adjustments to the code of conduct. So by the time it gets to you at that meeting, it will have been had board members looking through it and, and at it. The rest of this, again, we can mix and match. We'll be adding in a session related to digital learning technology. That'll be in one of the curriculum instruction assessment slots. Uh, so, but this just is a way for us to map out the year and plug things in. Um, so, all right. 
Can I make one comment about that? Does anybody else have a comment to make before I make a comment about it? The meetings? Well, Sorry well, about I, what? I, 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 just a thought. But do you want to go? No, no, sure. Go. Uh, the budget stuff, I know it lives in here, but... I thought we raised it up. It didn't... Well, I see it in here a couple spots, but I think we should have a standalone document that talks about how the evolution of budget discussions and dialogues mm -hmm. will progress over the year That's that doesn't you know, force us to kind of find the needle in the haystack here. Um, because I think, uh, you know, we want to be really thoughtful about how we raise up, tee up, discuss, and evolve the, the budget thinking earlier in the year and communicate with the public about that. Um, so I'm just, it's just a suggestion. I don't know that anything on this document has to change. But I, you know, I, I would have a suggestion that we're just really crystal clear, almost something we can share amongst ourselves to clarify and also share with the community so they can understand where and how they have touch points um, with the budget discussion. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I hear that. That's clear. Okay. So, Maureen, you and I can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any comments? On the meeting topics, right? On meeting topics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about um, the school year. Um, we understand that for a couple of reasons, um, both season, New York State, we need to wait. There was a discussion the last time we talked about this about possibly perhaps because. I think most people just want to know when school starts again. We've gotten a, a couple, you know, other comments from um, a little bit of an earlier heads up, and I know we had talked last time about would it be possible to just not tie to it, but at least have an understanding again about like whether it's starting before or after Labor Day. Would would that be possible? Could we try I, to add that someplace? We could. A fair amount of work though goes into building out the calendar. I mean, it's a fairly intensive process, uh, and I'd hate to have something come out in a skeleton that kind of misses it in a key place, yep. and we create expectations that and we people really get upset. fail on. Because we, we have to look at externally at BOCES, you have to look at the state, uh, you, you automatically have to have some sense of where your bargaining units are and things, they tend to agree. But for example, last year they were fairly clear they wanted pre-Labor Day start, uh, but then listened to you as a board, and, that, and you had the final say in that. So. I mean, we could do that. My worry would be, one, it's a lot. It is a fair amount of work. Um, it was something that Fee Goodman spent a lot of time on, and now that would be with Melissa and then working with Nancy. Uh, so several administrative staff spent a fair amount of time to line it all up, get it all to fit, because uh, you got to look at the other districts. It's very important we're lining up with the quads and all the rest. So, I mean, we could have a rough sense. I mean, you, I mean, you all have been very clear you want the commitment to start after Labor Day. I mean, I think then we just go into it saying, well, you know, we're going to try to do that. You know, that's a goal. Um, parents and families in Hastings are in the same situation. I'm going to sound a little harsh here. You're in the exact same situation <laughs> as every other district around here. Um, the, the saving grace, which New York State doesn't seem to do, is to do a two-year plan. Um, and, uh, you know, because then you at least have a better shot at it, but you hit the same wall. So we can keep, we can go back and look at about it. I mean, Melissa's two days old in her new seat. I mean, we can talk <laughs> a little bit about it. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm not sure we can pull it off in a way that is accurate enough to bank on. And Doreen, but we can take a look. I'd be a little hesitant at uh, trying to go uh, earlier than what we've been doing, not because of BOCES in New York State or because of the River Towns. I just feel like uh, we're a very small district and we we seem as a board to be involved in the calendar. And if we actually had two calendars going at once, it just seems like we would be involved in both of them. Whereas, uh, you know, trying as they say, it's an involved process. I mean, to uh, those families out there who really want to, who can plan their, you know, I guess their vacations or their family trips, you know, eight, nine months out. You know, it seems like we try to get it to the, we try to get it in public meetings by March. And that would just be one year out. I think if we had two, 
the discussions would uh, be unnecessary. Uh, we have some limitations that we've talked about in public for why we can't give it to you in, uh, as uh, maybe an email mentioned, start of the year for the next year. But uh, I'm comfortable with uh, one calendar uh, and the, I think, as Bill said, parents have to wait on this this is your main priority if you have kids in the schools it's going to you got to be uh, as flexible as possible my my interest would be keeping it at one and uh, March seems to be uh, the first discussions based on uh, the administration has said they can bring forward I mean I think there's a, an option here to think through which would be you've got the budget to worry about I think that's your first energy but it this year, I think is big there. I think portrait and the budget. And if I'm recommending where your energies and you sort of map what you're going to spend time on, those are your two biggies. And we are already positioning on what we think are a couple of the really topics you're going to face that we're going to be ready to come to you early with, not just so you can make the think about it. Because uh, one of the things that Marine and I and, and Melissa talked about is we don't want you having to grapple with big hot topics for the first time in a budget discussion. You know, we want to try and have you deal with that earlier. Uh, so there are a few of those. Um, that, that's the energy issue. But having said that, you know, maybe we can structure a little later in the fall discussion about when that calendar comes, to you, what are you hoping to see in it, just broadly defined? So you could say, we'd hope to see a post-Labor Day start. You know, can you think about the number of X holidays defined how? I'm being very equitable on putting that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, uh, we really want the school year to finish by roughly X date, you know, because that gives us some parameters to begin thinking about um, and you might be get some early feedback. I mean, Labor Day this next year is the fourth. Um, I mean, I want to commit to it, but that's early enough in this cycle that you could say the chances of having tools start after Labor Day are pretty good. Um, so, but I think they, we could at least do that if that's mm. helping. And it might help our process internally a little bit, right? Because if you think about last year, I think it worked really, really well, but we came with a pre-Labor Day start, and you as a board immediately pretty fast said, oh, sorry, no. You know, and you did that correctly, and I said, oh, and, and so many of us had a kind of pre-conversation with you to say, please, if possible, do you see what I'm saying? You know, I've already really? spent too many words on that point. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but is that? Yeah. All right, That's so. Good. Dr. Marquez, I have a, a, a question um, with regards to, so um, is what, when is the, I agree with Jeremy that, you know, my thing is if one should come out and then there's some slight change and people start crying, it becomes an issue because then of those slight changes. So that actually is what bothers me. But I, I, Jeremy mentioned that it's March. Is there a way that the deadline can be like sooner based on boosies or it it's, it's doesn't really work? I mean, we think it's three it's three variables. You really do want to line up the quads um, for all bunch of re your, your kids overlap in programs, then people that, are looking. That's a tough one to hear because you know. the pre-Labor Day starts were us specifically not lining up the quads. Well, right, but that was it. But we fixed it, and we, you fixed it. Yeah, and the year fixed. before, uh, it didn't get fixed. So I mean, it would be nice if we actually tried to line up with the yeah. quads. So, so I think it's lining up, and it's not lockstep, but you try and line up. So you try and line up there. You, you, there's some really significant issues with both so that you got to line up, uh, and and the assessment schedule, mm -hmm. and and that, and that. So we're dependent on that. So if you could do it earlier, you could. But everybody wants. We're, we're all in the same place. Got it. You know, everybody wants it earlier. Families in, in communities will have the means to travel. It's the exact conversation I've been in in my previous stops. And then you're kind of in this jam, and so then you got to say it's a compromise. So you, 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 so I let us do some thinking if we can begin to sort of have a conversation. Again, I don't want to distract you. You've got some heavy lifting to do on the budget. You've got heavy lifting to do on portrait. Uh, and so I'd like to minimize these other heavy things. So I think if we can at least have a discussion roughly about the calendar, what you want in the calendar, we could have that later in the fall, then that I think will help the process. And you know, Jeremy, you gave me a great example that then when we go in, you could say we value highly the quad match, or we don't. We value highly pre post Labor Day start. We value highly, I'm repeating myself purposely, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the end by X date in June. 
you know, and there's maybe some number of holidays you say, could you consider, if, is this the right number? Uh, and then when you have your uh, parent conference dates, you know, and then with those rough points, we might begin to see, do we start to have some information that we can come back early? Is that? Sounds great, thank okay. you. Okay, and you have a constituency. You can be saying your constituency, we're talking earlier about it, mm -hmm. right? Got it. Okay. Great, thank you. To -do so list. does anybody have anything <laughs> else about the meetings? Everybody okay with the meeting topics? Any questions, comments? I really appreciate seeing the calendar. It is helpful to see how we're planning the year. So I appreciate your efforts. It's flexible, or what you said. Uh, I want to say good job during the precedence of today. Thanks. You were not ready for Board of Education <laughs> comments, though. Excuse me. Oh, she hasn't. She's Excuse got me. 12 and 13. I have a few more things. Thank you. If you could keep it down on the side. Thanks. Um, 11 is second public comment. We don't have any public. Now we have um, number 12, Board of Education comments for comments or flattery. Is, that's where that comes up. So I'm going to speak. I'll try speaking quickly because I've dominated more than my one-tenth again. Uh, I like the way uh, Bill just put it. This year we do know what our priorities are. We have some, uh, you know, a uh, uh, Hastings port portrait of Hastings learner, and obviously our budget build out this year uh, is going to be a heavy lift. The other heavy lift that uh, for however uh, few people in our public are watching, the other heavy lift that the board looks at is uh, some of our contracts, which we don't do transparently although there are some aspects that we could discuss transparently. Uh, it seems to be more of an executive session with our lawyers, with our administrators, and with our trustees as we talk about that. But there is uh, the third heavy lift that unfortunately the public uh, does not see, and that is uh, you know, our largest uh, you know, budget item where we have our values and our priorities. So it is a challenge for uh, any of the the public who are interested in uh, how the trustees try to support administration and family. But uh, a large item is uh, one of our contracts that is coming up. As we mentioned, we have another executive session coming up in October. And that is where we do the least transparency in discussing uh, as a board what sort of uh, decisions we're considering, whether or not we want to add it as a third heavy lift or whether or not we uh, we we go a little bit s less heavy uh, in our discussions, but it's a uh, it's an interesting aspect of uh, the board that uh, is coming up in our next couple meetings. Jeremy, if if you allow me, um, I'm not being rude, but I think the word transparency may be the wrong choice of word. Probably is. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So I mean. The, the contract is public, and I know the community members, they look at it and all of that, but a discussion by law cannot be a public discussion because it's a lot of personal um, information, stuff like that, in, in talking about the contract. So, like, that's what I think you were saying. So the term transparency is what I was... Yeah, I could consider that. I'm not sure uh, what aspects, uh, you know... Uh, a public discussion about such a large budget item would entail, but the budget item that uh, we will be discussing in executive session is the largest aspect of the next three budgets. And uh, without naming uh, people or personnel, I think there are aspects of that that uh, is challenging in our role because I believe there are uh, reasons for uh, almost uh, what we do is 100% of the discussion is in uh, executive session. Legally, we're allowed to negotiate our and discuss our, you know, our concerns in executive session. But I do find it uh, challenging to the public. The largest part of the budget or the, or the largest way administration can, uh, no, that's not true. Administration has a lot of uh, tools at their hand. But this one that we're talking about, earlier in this month as we had an executive session and coming up again in October. It's a big one and I do, uh, 
if I had a different word than transparent, uh, it's one that we don't uh, bring forward to the public for a, a variety of reasons, but it is out there on our calendar. It's, uh, it's coming forward. Thank you, Dr. Lang. I hear what you're saying, Jeremy. I agree it would be so much easier if we could let the public know what the ask is by the group, what the reasons for the negotiation by our groups are, like how we got to that and how we got to the answer. Unfortunately, legally, we can't, but I hear what you're saying. Um, we have the great and powerful Oz. Do you have any <laughs> final comments? Uh, I, I, thank you very much. Uh, I do. I just, um, at the two upcoming back to school nights, I'm going to be talking about the importance of participation in the, in the POHL survey that's going to go out. And I definitely uh, sort of comment to the rest of the board members, if we could all really make a whole point of whichever constituencies we reach, really encouraging them to participate in this. Because I'll tell you, I've been looking over other districts, portraits, or, or these other names they use for that thing. And I've seen you know, some done really poorly, and obviously some done well. But what I particularly noticed, I won't name the district, but there's a district, <laughs> very, there's a very, very small district in Putnam, Putnam County, <laughs> that did a portrait process. Uh, and when I initially clicked into it, I was like, this is a tiny district. It's not going to be very perfunctory. But it was really, like, perhaps the best one that I, that I saw. Mm. It was so authentic. And when, in my head, it was like, the reason for that must be because it's a real small community. And they got real participation, and they had real discussions, and they got a really good output from that. So I just want to encourage us as individual board members, as, as a collective, to really, you know, over the next two months, reach out to people and have them participate. Because uh, the more I see, the more I'm convinced that the only way we're going to get a good result is if we have deep, authentic participation uh, that leads to deep, authentic discussion. And I'm excited by that. Seeing that, that work in that small district um, was exciting, frankly. So whatever we can do to get there. But thank you, everybody. Thanks. OK. Any final comments? No? OK. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. <laughs> you Thank were you just admitted. waiting oh my to God, do I've been that. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Waiting yeah, to so just do that. Make it firm, but. Yeah, you know, right. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's probably, uh, yeah. we're probably we still on for a while. Oh. But we don't do much besides walk out the door. Yeah. Uh, we, this one was the executive session, but is there was there any decision on to whether our, our other meetings would be earlier than 7:30, or if, no, if so, maybe you'll bring that I up cannot. in uh, when you meet.